Yes, welcome. We have a different site before us that we usually do, so it should be interesting. <laughs> uh, we'll turn this to, we'll go ahead and start. We'll open our work session and we'll turn the time to Karina. Thank you. I actually am going to turn the time to you. Right. We got a whole thing going for us, you know. Well, we're uh, we're excited to be with y'all today. Um, it's uh, it is wild to me to think that events is a year old, uh, and also only a year old. But we've been doing this for forever. Uh, but we're really excited about what we have to present today. Um, we, as a uh, events team, obviously Sydney and Karina, and myself, and. Um, all, all of the departments really uh, pitch in on these. We set out a year ago to start to create a calendar of sort of community pillar events. Uh, we love Orem Fest and what that does, you know, the first week of June. Uh, it's just such a fun event. We were able to uh, add in our Lights On experiences last year. Uh, we enjoy partnership with a number of other organizations that help us uh, bring events to life through the CIRA, through our partnership with IHC for the Fall Festival or with University Place for our Touch a Truck. Um, and so we always want to be, you know, cognizant of the greater calendar uh, of community events and, and work with these other organizations. Uh, but we think we have identified our next community pillar size event. Um, a lot of this is based off of the feedback that y'all as council have provided to us in terms of our areas of focus. We wanted to do something that we think highlights the unique business environment, uh, specifically around food. Uh, we think we have something that highlights the unique cultural aspects of our community and brings us together. Uh, this is a, a revamp of a existing uh, defunct event, Taste of Orem, uh, but we have, uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have Karina who has given, given it the, the Karina once over. And so uh, we're here to present to y'all today the idea or concept of the Taste of Orem event uh, as a fall uh, outdoor community pillar event. So I'll sort of kick it back to our team here. And it wouldn't be a Karina event without getting you guys excited about the event. So what you guys have in front of you is an example of what you are going to have with Taste of Orem. And so what myself and Sydney did is that we went to uh, many of the local businesses that we have, and we have a menu next to it of like um, the empanada that is from Asado. We have Holy Tacos, we have Fruteria, we have the Chubby Baker. Um, we also have the Bangkok Wasabi. And then the other one was um, Memos, which is a Mexican bakery that is just sort of across the street. So dig in while we tell you about um, Taste of Orem. So like Bryce said, so this is a new staple that we are wanting to introduce to Orem City. So this is a food festival as well as a cultural arts um, event. Uh, this is something that we have been tasked with doing this year is finding ways that we can have inclusion with our businesses and with um, all the different demographics that, or, you know, um, different cultures that we have here in Aura. And so what better way to understand culture than through food, uh, which is my favorite way of understanding different cultures. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, welcome to Taste of Aura. Uh, like Greg said, this was something that was introduced a while ago, and so we are wanting to um, have our take on what we want it to be. And we want it to be more than a food festival. And we have looked into a uh, market study of like, who else does anything like this? And there's no one else in uh, Utah County that does like a food festival. Um, the reason why we also want to do this is um, something that is very interesting with Orem Fest, because of the size of the carnival and the boutiques that we have, um, we actually turn away about 80% of the food vendors that apply um, for Orem Fest because the space only allows up to 26 food vendors and we get about 80 to 90 applications. And so it's hard. And so we're like, okay, let's take that and let's make it this own thing because everyone loves food. Um, and then we also want to introduce all of the, as you can see, amazing restaurants that we have here in Forum. Perfect. So we are going back to like, you know, why Taste of Orem? We want this to be, again, that new staple event in Orem. We have a couple of those. We have Orem Fest, we have Lights On, and we want this to be a new staple. Um, and like Karina said, yeah, this isn't really an idea that we have in Utah County right now. Again, we've looked in, there's like an option in Salt Lake of 
they kind of do a little one and then obviously there's different food festivals in Park City, but this is big and different for Utah County. Uh, and then we want this event to showcase the different culture and art expression in our city. We know that there's so much out there and that we know that there's a lot of people that are interested in a lot of this. They just don't really know. Um, and so we want this to help the local businesses as well as have that connection between us and then our residents. And then we just want to celebrate all these different cultures that we have. There's so many different opportunities. <coughs> And so we're going to go into just a little bit about how it works. So actually, I'm, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm from Canada. And back home, we have something really similar. And it's super successful. And this is kind of how they did it. And so we were talking to a lot of different departments um, with finance and with um, like legal. And this is kind of how we wanted to start it. So the event itself is free. We want everybody to come and obviously be included. But we wanted to do like a kind of like a ticket system. And so... We have, we'll have several check-in areas throughout the park, and those will be, you know, several tents where you can have, like, a one-stop shop where you can buy these tickets, and then that would be it. So, for example, we would have 30 tickets for $30, um, and then we would be working with the businesses. We have had connections and helped talk to Kathy in um, development with all of her business alliance connections to work with these businesses to create um, – and change their food members to accommodate, sorry, food menus to accommodate this. Um, and so each vendor would have the, these different tiers of ticket menu items. So as you can see there, there's the ticket tiers. So we would have everyone, um, require everyone to have a sample. And that could be something that is like their best selling item that they you know normally create, it could be like a curry, it can be like a taco. And that is just two to four tickets. And so with everything being like a dollar, that kind of you know works out how they can figure that out and then we would also have like a meal and then a combo so similar to how like all food vendors have them at their like food trucks and food booths we, it would be a similar payment it would just be like that one kind of stop shop for the tickets and the pricing so that we can help out with that so like i was saying we want this to be more than a food festival we want this to be an experience and so we want to add in the cultural arts experience. So on our main stage, we would love to have different um, cultural performances. And so, um, you know, the ones that we see at Orin Fest, we can also see or get new groups that um, don't get to be at Orin, be Orin Fest because of, you know, the high demand of wanting to perform. And then we'll have um, like culinary demonstrations. We were thinking about, um, you know, just ingredients. It's a huge um business here in Orem and having them have an hour to go on stage and explain what is just experience how do you incorporate it into your everyday cooking or your everyday lifestyle and so having that culinary demonstration and then we thought something that would be really fun is we'll have a frames all around the park and so you can do it uh, make it kind of like a competition a camaraderie between the businesses and so we'll have like the people's choice so they can try these samples scan that QR code and then submit um, their choice. And then we would have a city officials <laughs> vote. And so that's where you guys will be able to walk around, try the different samples, you'll have the pin, and then you can cast your vote as well. And then we'll have um, an ex expert uh, vote where we're hoping to get like UVU culinary or um, restaurant owners and get their input on um, just something that is fun and having like a little bit of a competition of um, between the foods. Then we also want to focus on the food lovers experience. So like I said, we would have those vendors demonstrations, but then we would also have like UVU culinary go out with their students and do some demonstrations and do some education or recruitment to their um, program. We can also, something that we got really excited about that is very famous in Kansas City is um, a grilling and smoking competition. And so we have worked with the fire and police and thought about it. They will combine together and it will be like, hey, come see if you can compete against our public safety and compete in uh, a grilling competition um, at this event. Uh, we were thinking about cake decorating and then all of these other examples of uh, things that we can focus on uh, throughout this event and introduce uh, more to the public. Perfect. So... Here's a little bit more about just some of those log logistics. We have like the cost offset. So we know that we're making, um, we have a certain portion. So because we have those ticket sales um, that we are gonna be over, 
or you'll be helping um, to retain that transactional percentage of the ticket sales as well, um, just to help with businesses. And again, that is something that we've talked to finance about, that we have um, talked about the logistics of, as well as looking for those sponsors that Karina mentioned. Um, and some of that will help to have money to go back into events and to the city. And then we also are looking at opportunities that we can um, help with the Forum Community Foundation, as well as the food pantry. We have like the food pantry so close by in the Friendship Center. And so finding a way to incorporate that and then give back to Orem is something that we also will be doing. And then we also just have the quick park layout. So this is just a little bit, of course, it's like a little bit similar to Orem Fest, but we have those food um, tents and vendors in the middle of the park. We have those check-in and ticket um, stations around. We'll have the barbecue like competition in the parking lot with the Friendship Center. And then we have some other different options um, that we can look into. So like I said, we have worked tirelessly uh, meeting with every department, um, getting their input, getting um, what they think could make this event really successful. And so we have the events team and these are all of the things that we will be going over or be overseeing. And then of course the help of everyone in Orm City because it is just three of us, but as much as I have confidence in ourselves, we definitely will be reaching out to different departments to help us out um, to pull this off. And then this is just a little bit of a timeline. We will be moving rather quickly on this to get the vendor applications and everything by September. And then it will be held here at um, City Center Park. So that is Taste of Orem. I would love to open it up to see if you guys have any questions, comments. Um, what's your favorite food that you just tried? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Try to get. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Can I just say one thing? So I, this is so interesting. I just had a conversation with a friend a couple weeks ago, and um, she was talking about how she's from Peru, Peruana, mm -hmm. right? And she says, I was not a Latina until I came to the States. I was always Peruana. You know, I was yeah. always a Peruvian. And so I think this would be great to just highlight. They're different. These yeah. countries are different. They have different cultures. And in our elementary school, they learn different dances. Uh -huh. all the different countries and how fun to have that brought out you know for them to be able to share that um and the pacific islanders right mm -hmm. we've seen all the different um cultures there that we can celebrate and then the food of course gotta love that we're yeah. just talking about pouring pigs will we ever <laughs> pour a pig could we roast a pig? Uh, um, I get cheap center. Yeah, like, <laughs> I've never been there. Oh, it's safe. Like, they pour the pig. That is just the How best. fun would that be? Yes. yes. Um, anyway, I love it. I love it. Thank you. So, Steve, are you going to let us have fun or not? <laughs> no, I'm very anti fun. I <laughs> <laughs> might just highlight. You know, of course, we've heard over the years the desire to do more celebration of our of our uh, different cultures that are living here in Orem and they're doing business here in Orem. Meanwhile, we've been having a lot of success in adding bougie and bling on a budget for events. And then we've also had a lot of success in recruiting new uh, food uh, businesses. And so bringing all these things kind of together we feel like the potential upside or benefit is worth the risk of, you know, maybe falling on our face if we end up not being able to execute perfectly. Um, so there's enough, there's enough that seems right with it. It's worth the effort. But if you've got feedback or questions or concerns. No, I, I've been wanting to do this for years. Um, and I, I'm so excited and, and and the detail that you pulled together already is amazing. Um, if there's anything I can do to help, I would love to help. Um, I just, I think, you know, going along with what Lene is saying, this is such a, a wonderful opportunity to pull the community together and to be an Orem family, you know, um, and it's just the celebration of culture, of food, music, dance, it is, that will be fun. If Steve will let us have fun. Oh, <laughs> that's all. Oh, <laughs> <Steve. laughs> <laughs> Wait, does he even get out of the way? No, no, no. Yeah. No matter what. Thank you. No. no, no. Oh, yes. Just one other weird 
spin on <clears throat> have some kind of a competition or a demonstration on canning preservation mm -hmm. at the county fair you've got food uh, canning judging and that kind of stuff this would be a good preliminary event for that in which is a different part of a different culture too yeah that is a good point. and teaching the young kids how to can yeah I do not have so that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> no, thank you. That's a really good point. And can I add one more thing? Yeah. So bad this one. I said that before. And I'm learning a lot about the Scandinavian influence. Yes. In our city, like from the the Ava Carlotta story, right? The Pioneer Babies. Um, huge influence there. So I would like to have some of that yeah. opportunity to experience that culture too. Yeah, we're definitely trying to reach out to all of the cultures that we can because we again we have so many different types of restaurants and mm -hmm. so we are doing our we're we're reaching out to everyone and see if we can hit them as well this is looks great <laughs> thank you. no and again thank you guys for your support i think with myself and sydney you know we are really appreciative that we are given this opportunity to put on an event like this uh we could not do it without the support of bryce and brennan ryan and um, of course, without the support of you guys. And I know with just that, we're going to make it so successful and we're going to make it a new staple of Laura. Uh, I mean, this time next year, as we're reporting on the success of this event, we need a picture on there with all of us. Yes. Same. We're in case of Laura. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll be like kind of stains everywhere. So we'll be like, yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, that is everything. Thank you guys so much for your time and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It sounds fun. It's <laughs> awesome. Good. And this is delicious. Oh, okay. good. <laughs> and then that we take it off. Surprise of York got jumping into it. Um, that's that we're so excited. I think we wanted to set the skeleton of the event, and then you know, we had I don't know if you can see in the box over on the side. I think we had gone into like a tailgating meets food experience over there, but then we could go the we had talked a lot about preserving and canning and our garden demonstrations right there. We had talked about Dutch ovens, the grilling competition. I think as we put the announcement out that this is an event and we want the experiential cooking, I think the right ones will come to us. And I, we don't have, we're not set on whether it's, you know, which direction we go. I think we'll just, we just want to hear what's important to our residents and our businesses, and then we'll organize the event and the judging and all that around it. But I love the idea of a number of residents going home with blue ribbons for Dutch oven and pres preserving and, and grilling and smoking and a number of businesses, I think, We've talked about making a really cool, gaudy trophy that goes to these businesses <laughs> that becomes iconic. We want something that they're going to put front and center so that we know if it's, you know, Chubby Baker or Yonuts or whatever dessert, they want to have this trophy. And yeah. and, and so, yeah, we're, we're really excited about taking it whichever direction it goes, you right. know, as, as we hear from people. Can we bring Bobby Flay? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> sure whoever yeah, whoever yeah. wins our competition. Yeah. 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 There, there, are, there are all kinds of competitions you could have. You know, I mean, like chili cookoffs in the fall. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, yeah. There's like chicken, cookouts. salmon, ribs. Like, there's so many different um, ideas that we can go off of. That's why we have to do it all day, so we can have a lunch hour and a yeah. dinner hour. Yeah. Yeah. Double, yeah. double the amount of food we can. Consume it one day. Exactly. Are you looking at doing mostly the park? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, we had, we had talked about some ideas where the event started here and maybe expanded back to the brick and mortar restaurants over the next couple of weeks. Some of uh, the other cities that we looked at did more of this tour of restaurants, but I think as we thought about you know some of the cultural art celebration festivals, some of the family activity, we we decided to bring the restaurants and businesses to us. We've seen it work for Warren Fest, and so yeah, well, I think we'll be at a park. For this one, but again, as we work with the, uh, with Kathy and the Orm Business Alliance, we're definitely open to feedback as we try to make this you know sustainable year after year. Love it. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Yes, yeah. good to see you. Thank 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 you.
Okay, next up, uh, number two, Bryce, Library Community Impact Survey. I'll slide over here in the driver's seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, Mayor and Council, uh, I just wanted to provide an update today. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, through all of our social media channels, working with the communications team, we sent out a survey from the Orem Public Library uh, as a community impact uh, study. This was a big part of our strategic plan that we spent last year putting together and really trying to solidify our library and where we're at and what we're doing well and what we want to improve on. But it was really important to us that we got some baseline and data and information as to how residents use and interact with the public library. Uh, we also wanted to start to establish uh, that the library would proactively communicate. Uh, we have a wonderful story at the library. We wanted to make sure that we were getting that story out to our residents and that they could understand the work that we were doing and how that was going. Um, as part of our project, our community impact survey, uh, we received 436 responses to our survey. Uh, the group that we worked with from the RBDC uh, then followed up and did a number of focus group interviews um, on the phone or in person, just talking to these residents to hear, again, how do they use the library? What do they love? What are the challenges? Um, and this was really good, again, baseline data so that we could hear the median experience, not necessarily, you know, maybe the people that would want to call in or maybe that they're so involved, they love everything and they're a super user. We just wanted to hear from our residents. Um, and so we, we, we wanted to ask sort of two questions through this process. What was your experience at the library or with the library? And then what kind of impact were we having on our average residents? In your council uh, packet, you have access to all of this information. It was about an 80 or 90 page survey. We're not gonna go over all that today, but you get a chance to see who uses the library, how long did they come, what are they doing? Um, and what we wanted to ask was again, are, are you satisfied? And our information here tells us that we have a really high satisfaction rate. You know, 93% of our people feel uh, that we are meeting their needs. Uh, we had only 0.7% of our respondents say that they didn't feel like their needs were being met. We were able to talk to them and say, let's, let's hear about that. And what was great to hear was that the types of issues that they were having with the library uh, were pedestrian. You know, they wanted more holds or they wanted more copies of books or they wanted to have the book for longer, but also have other people have fewer access to it so they can have more books. <laughs> you know, that we want everything and we want more and we want it now. Uh, so it was, it was great to talk to them though and just hear these, these very day-to-day -day things that were important. The questions we had asked as, uh, as pertinent to our strategic plan uh, were, what were we doing well? What changes would you want? Do you trust us? Are we having an impact? And then we had sort of a question that we wanted to, <coughs> to answer. And that was, did people view the library as an errand or as a destination? And of course, the answer is both. They need to drop off a book through the drive through book, uh, or if they just got to go in and grab a hold and get out of there, we're an errand. Uh, they do that on the way to the grocery store or after school pickup or something similar. For the other, for 51% of the respondents, we were a destination. They wanted to go over, they wanted to be there, they wanted to have a relationship with the librarian, they wanted to go to a program, they wanted to have a conversation, they wanted something deeper. And so our goal was to sort of split those into two different things. And so if they were only ever destination, uh, only ever errands, could we make it quicker and easier? Um, you've seen some things like the new Hillcrest Park has a library locker and library book drop. So if you live on the south end of the city, you can just say, please, I would like to have this book. Leave it over at Hillcrest for me. And if you've used an Amazon locker before you go, you'll receive an email code. You type it in and your book's waiting for you. So ideally, those that are maybe limited by our parking or limited by public transportation or they just don't want to drive as far, now they can get that there. And then they can return How do you your book. that? What's it? Sorry. How utilized is that? It, it uh, will open when the park opens on May 14th. Okay. So not at so all. So far, not at all. Zero. <laughs> not a single person. <laughs> But we're, we're very interested because if it goes if it goes well, we would love to see one of those library locker drop book systems at our recreation center. You're already out of the car. You're already there. Now you can just have your book waiting for you and go from there. Um, so, uh, again, we wanted to separate out. Are you using us as a destination or errand and how can we improve both of those experiences? Uh, which was fun for us. And so uh, if you were a destination, we want it to be more exciting. We want to focus on relationship. Uh, you know, if you're a librarian and you are having to deal with a lot, not deal with, um, if you have a lot of very simple repeated tasks over and over, you're, you maybe don't have time to interact on a deeper level. And so if we can remove some of those and leave you and give you as a staff permission to spend 20 or 30 minutes with somebody, then maybe we can build that relationship. So uh, as part of the focus group, we had some value propositions. I joked about it earlier. They wanted the book for longer and also they wanted shorter holds 
and how do we hit that sweet spot? And so we got some information there. We had a lot of requests for more Spanish material. Every time we buy a Spanish material item, though, it's replacing an English material item. What is the perfect balance? Uh, we heard last uh, meeting from the NGT study. Do we buy digital or, or do we lease a digital item uh, license or do we buy a physical item and, and then absorb the ongoing maintenance costs and square footage cost of, a, of, a, of an item? So again, the Community Impact Survey gives us and our staff a really good baseline or, uh, amount of data and uh, we're really just excited about this. So some recommendations that you can see uh, from both the community impact and the user experience. Um, Things that we're doing really, really well that we're ex uh, excited about. Uh, people feel like they have access to the library. They feel like we have an incredibly knowledgeable staff um, and they just had great things to say about the people that they interacted with. Uh, there was also a lot of excitement around our programs, uh, what we would call collection access, and then the physical materials or digital materials that we have, which we call our, uh, our collection. Um, they came with some recommendations, things like expanding our operating hours or our drop-off system. Uh, those come with the cost and so again it'll be a value proposition but we're excited about maybe some Saturday night activities or events maybe uh, one day a week we open up at 6 a.m. for our early risers and they can get into the library on their way to work or on their way to a workout um, but a couple of exciting things there things like the book sale uh, seem like a really easy chance for us to host an event rather than just having stacks of books out there can we make it a event like some of our other libraries do um, and go from there we also identified a couple of things um, affectionately we call them monovalent dissatisfiers. Uh, they, can, they cannot make you happy, they can only make you sad. Think referees in sports, and no one left the game like, you know what, we lost, but wow, they have some great calls out there. <laughs> but word, the best you can do as a ref is not upset somebody. Um, I think we had a couple of those things in our library that we've identified, you know, specifically with how we deal with fines on children's books. No one's ever you know, excited about that, and so we thought, Maybe if we make a book sale more engaging, we can raise enough funds there to offset having to charge a young parent because their child may or may not have damaged a book and may or may not have been the last one to have it when that page ripped when we have to have this really sort of accusatory, accusatory conversation with somebody that we just don't know. And so we, our thought would be, how can we get rid of those really negative experiences where we just, the best we can do is not upset them. Um, and the worst we can do is really upset them and instead just get rid of that uh, without having it be an impact to our budget. Uh, so we're really excited to look for some of those things. I think you'll also continue to see um, a lot of emphasis on our Spanish language collection, um, both in terms of the number and types of items that we have. And uh, we currently have some great work with how we catalog and create access to those collections. So if you are a Spanish language speaker, not in there to search for books about Spanish, but to just have Spanish language novels, you know, to make that a little bit easier to understand how you can get those access and access those items. One of the other uh, high priority recommendations here was to create an experience library. And that spoke to us as sort of central to what we're trying to accomplish as a destination. Uh, there's a number of really exciting things uh, that are on the immediate horizon there. Uh, specifically, uh, some of the work that we'll be looking at for our courtyard and the current um, plaza space that we're sitting in now once our new uh, city center is completed. How can we activate those outdoor spaces for people to come and be here and not just come and grab something and leave or not have enough seating or space to, to congregate in small groups. Uh, we're really excited about Library Hall. Again, additional access. I can't wait for the number of residents that when this building, this portion of this building comes down and you have this gorgeous walkway that will create, how many of them will say, I had no idea that you had an auditorium here. I can't believe you built this when you built the city center. And we'll say it's actually five years old. Um, <laughs> we're excited for that. And so we look at the things that people experience and we want to prioritize uh, access to those. Um, if you're familiar with the PERC collection, uh, this is an interactive library of things focused on early childhood education. Uh, we're working with the PERC organization right now to absorb that into our collection so that we can check it out for them. Their volunteers can focus on programming and interaction. We'll bring it out of the basement upstairs right alongside the rest of our children's collection and will be easier to use. Uh, I mentioned the uh, changes to how we acquire digital materials as well as Spanish language materials. And we're looking at, uh, we're, we're taking a hard look at some of our policies that are organized and maybe saying, how can we make this more user-friendly uh, based off of some of the feedback we got here? Maybe our holds, maybe our fines, uh, maybe the number of items we have out of the time. Uh, where can we just really help families that are using this and doing their best and still collect, uh, protect the collection and protect our investment in the collection? We have, 
Again, over 400,000 physical items. Uh, that represents a significant investment over decades uh, for our library. But also, collection is only as good as people have access to and trust <clears> us <throat> to use it. So we want to make sure that they have a chance to do that. Um, that's it. Uh, the library is doing well. The library is important. It has a strong social impact. Uh, it is popular. Uh, we shared this at our last library advisory commission. Uh, but during our first quarter, we had 20% more users and uh, user interactions than we did that this time last year. More people are coming in significant numbers and they're talking to our librarians and they're having those conversations and those relationships. I'm uh, really excited about that. Um, uh, Linda Gallagher, she is our collection services uh, division manager. Uh, she came up with our motto of Let's Library. Uh, and so she's, she's been instrumental in this. Mike uh, and Jamie are other division managers as well in both gathering this data, helping us ask the right questions and then making sure that we're sort of primed to act on this uh, baseline data and uh, go forward with our strategic plan for this year. So that is our community impact survey information. Again, you have the entirety of it in your packets, but uh, do, you have, do you have any questions for us? I was just impressed with the depth and the breadth of your survey. Um, I couldn't get through all of it, but I went through a lot of it, and I was blown away how much, you know, how, how far you dug down to get the responses, and then to have the actual responses, their, their comments. Um, I think it was helpful too. The comments, especially the, yeah, the, just the to anecdotal. What, to see what our neighbors are saying about the library is kind of fun. Great. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I was going to say that same thing. The, the comments were very impressive to, to have them all listed in that in your packet there to have taken, you know, put everybody's thoughts. I really appreciated that. Um, I have a few things. The Perk Center. Thank you for doing that, for extending the hours. I think that would be one of the biggest frustrations. I, when I discovered that when I had young kids, when kids, that was amazing, but then it was difficult because it didn't have consistent hours because it was based on volunteers, staffed by volunteers through. Anyway, that's fantastic for doing that. Um, one comment on the Spanish um, library. So um, that has a great need for, we have so many students in our community that are doing, doing dual language immersion classes. Mm -hmm. I ended up back then, their library didn't, when my kids were in it, didn't have a lot of those. So I just bought them through Scholastic Books or whatever, those early readers and the Magic Treehouse and those books. So I guess I would say, let's do it for the, the native community, but also think of this, I think we'll be serving this other community also as we pull more of those um, books in. And I hope it isn't a switch off. I hope we don't have to pull a book to put more of those. I hope we can just increase increase that. Um, and then my last comment, when I read through that, I saw someone say, story time. 10 o'clock is a tough time. When you have young babies, they take their naps at 10 and two. And so until they, shift to the afternoon nap only. But the 10 a.m. time, um, you know, my kids were just falling asleep then. So I don't know if you can figure out. It did have that they were going to address that, I noticed, in the study. So I think that that would open up um, opportunities for maybe some other additional participation. We did we did some testing with some afternoon sessions and they completely filled up. It was oh, instant. And so did they? Um, I think we're really excited about being able to expand that. And, you know, we call it collection access for programming and all of this. It brings people into the collection. And so I think we're realizing that that shift towards programming is not a loss of books and librarianship admission. It's bringing more people in to have access to it. So. Uh, in the budgets that we submitted for this year, uh, you will you will see a shift, but not even a shift. To your point, uh, some some cost savings on personnel allowed us to expand all of our collections uh, budgets this year without an increase in our overall budget. And so we were able to not have it be a trade off. Right now, uh, we were just able to increase every one of our collection budgets and our programming budget so that we can have those types of programs. So is there an opportunity to do like I mean a nine a.m. Yep. Versus the 10, because then the kids can go in here and then they're tired. You take them home and they go to take their 10 and get yeah. um, Plus, can I say one of the things, Miss Orem, I went when she read to the kids. She had an activity where she went in and read in the library. That was so cute because it was the older kids and she had them doing activities and standing up and dancing and talking to their neighbor. Just the whole, what you guys are doing there was really Great, because it wasn't just learning about, you know, reading and learning. They uh, encouraged interaction. So 
tell your library staff that was a perfect. Thank you. So they mentioned something about you know we all bought books when our kids were younger, and is there a line of book donations that you don't want to cross? And I mean that like you don't want everybody just bringing all their stuff out of their garage of you know from nineteen seventy whatever. <laughs> but but would that be a helpful thing? And I know we've done ten of book drives. In the past, is that something we, that we regularly receive? Maybe, maybe not hundreds of books per week, and then those that don't meet the quality or needs of the collection are taken to the book sale. Um, and if they're okay. not sold there, then they are donated. And so we're able to accept everything. Okay. And then again, if, if based on the librarianship principles, it doesn't muster add it to the collection, then we are able to take the book sale or go along. So yeah, we encourage residents to bring them by. That'd be great. Can I just say quickly that I love that that Bryce and our library management are doing this. This is when you have something that's so directly engaging and interacting with the public of a service that does that, then you want in order to be in a with an attitude of continuous improvement, you need to get good information to then make good goals moving forward. So this is an effort that that Bryson's rec leadership team have done uh, since we opened our new Rec Center. I'm just love seeing this now applied to our library services. It helps us again make sure that we're being very specific and detailed about improving and doing new things and making sure that we're responding to the, the demands we're hearing from our residents. Right. No, it's, it's definitely a really good direction that the library's gone. Just as far as I mean, there was always a debate do we want the library, do we need the library to. And you know, there's all these arguments on both sides, but I think what you've been doing is going to the path that we need the library, we want the library. Let's forget how to make it the best library possible. I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. Our, our, our residents shared that sentiment. It is a resounding need uh, for the city. It is so important to our families. It is central to their experience of being an Orem resident to have this uh, jewel of a library right at the center of town. So it's it's our job to get them here, remove the barriers that are preventing it, and make yeah. sure they have a great time while they're here. Right, and, we, and we've got we've got a good budget that supports it, so yep. we should make it the best it can be. Great, so okay, thanks, Bryce. Okay, let's move on to item number three, and uh, this will be Carrie and Carson and our people online. Yes, and we'll go to the MGT analysis. While Carson is getting us connected to that. Um, as you recall, we're looking at every department uh, division in the in the city to see if there's any um, ways that we can be more efficient, or um, just to just to to show that we are being as efficient as possible in this area. So for today, we're going to talk about the recreation department and public works. You can do this one also if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. That's on you. Uh, Bruce, are Bruce, are you there? Can you hear me? Do you hear me? Are you able to hear me? You said you said yes or barely. First, can you try speaking again? Are you able to hear me? Vainly, <laughs> there's some feedback. Uh, I'm, I'm on, on the phone. phone. I'm, 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 Are you able to join?
enjoyed off of your computer. Are you able to? Are you able to hear me, Carson? I hear you. I hear you. Do you hear me, Carson? Are you able to hear me? Hello. <laughs> Well, it sounds like we're having some difficulties on the range. Um, I have the presentation though, so I can go ahead and talk to most of the points. Hello, are you able to hear me? With all of the content. So um, today we have two reports, the public works report and the recreation um, report. Um, we'll be starting with the public works report. Um, what MGT um, did for their study for, for public works was going in and looking at the um, some of the divisions. Carson, are you able to hear works, me? Uh, Testing one, two, three. Specifically, the parks division and the traffic division. Um, are you able to, to see are what you those able staffing to hear me? levels were um, with the workload that they experienced, with the with the expectations we have as a city. Um, next, they looked at the organizational structure of the public works department as a whole um, to see what the industry best practices were for that organizational structure. And, and management. And then finally, they went in and looked at the risk and safety management practices within the department. So um, with the first point, uh, with staffing, uh, looking at the parks division, our, our city is pretty on par with what other cities have per acreage with their FTE. Um, so our city is within uh, uh, a good area or good bargain of, of best practice with staffing or parks. Um, Carson, can I just add to that? I think Chris, you could probably identify that we've done a shift in some of our positions for seasonals. Um, so we exchanged about, uh, I think it was 10, uh, 10 FTEs that were seasonals that were working around 1,000 hours a year. Uh, we can't exchange that with about uh, the equivalent number of full-time employees that are benefited. So one can be heard for uh, technicians. As we are trying to embrace and support the, the great vision of, of Bryce Merrill, um, we decided that we needed some full-time support on the shoulder months. When he's holding his uh, softball tournaments in February and praying that it doesn't snow, Right, but we need, we need to embrace this work. It's a great vision of, of that's Bryce. that's the background in that. We've exchanged that we needed some full time support on the shoulder model time. Yeah, when he's holding Which his is uh, soft efficiency, the fact that you're right. going for 20 hours, right? Or at we need, we need to embrace this you know, being there all day at their park. <laughs> It's a great vision. Oh, so it's that's, great, that's the back. A great Jewish office transition, though. So we can position to buy full time. Full time. Yeah, then he's holding to a significant self efficiency of the fact that you're only going for 20 hours, right? For a great vision. It's a great vision. It's being there all day at their park. It's a great vision. So it's that's the back. A great Jewish office transition, though. So we can position to buy full time. Yeah, 
send that to me. I'll send it out to my uh, uh, other recorders. Okay. Because one of the I don't want to send it to you. I'll send it to your cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Oh, that's that's right. Yeah. I don't want to it. Because it'll be like, what is? Okay. You tell me if it got if it came through. When oh, well, it's uh, it's in there. Somebody posted that on their Facebook. They thought it was cute. The most that. The most we've had like even like uh, no, 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 yeah, we yeah we can see levels and hear levels. We just need to check one more. Okay. We just did like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> well, that's I did print out the slides so show I could still present and make copies for everyone. Oh wow, you're prepared. Yeah, that was the idea. You knew we were trying to sabotage you and. Well, no, I came yesterday <laughs> with Pete. Pete. I came, made sure it all worked. Tried the right stuff. You never know. No, you never know. And if we do, we'll just I'll send you to print that one for every. So I'll go get my computer. Well, we're excited. Is Heather oh, here? Carson. Is Heather going to be with you? Uh-huh. Oh, I yes, haven't yeah, seen yeah. her today. Carson, this is Taylor. I think Taylor. we met. Yeah, okay. We have met. Okay. Before He's... you finished okay. your turn out, yeah. I think. Yeah. He's no, great. Off so I, I do miss you guys. I miss the, I miss the staff a lot. Well, we still get to interact with you at on occasion. So like and I'm on Ormfest Parade also. Committee. I'm also yeah. one of the four. Oh, see? Pray. I'm over volunteers and garbage. I don't know what that means about me, but... <laughs> right. okay. it, it's possible it went in the first time on the if we had that much yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> and it was some guy's computer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh did he have his phone standing uh, like this? Oh, I love it when they do that. Uh, so good. For doing so much. Every Every time. Really? Uh huh. <laughs> Well, it removes Zoom from being your backbone, just like the other one, right? So Zoom's not the backbone. You're not dependent on whether it's Zoom. It, it comes down to like the operator, the, op the operator having the ability to just say mute for now. Now, if you bring Zoom into the Zoom, can still break. Yeah, like, there's no getting around. I can still break, but. But your meeting can continue. We can route around because the yeah. whole point of the unit can say you have access to every meeting we have. Yeah. And you can control it on the fly. Like right now, what we're doing in the office, we're relying on the acquisition board. We have no concurrence. So, so we can look with the unit set up. Maybe outside. Yeah. Yeah. To an extent. Yeah. I guess the audio. Where, where your video is routed through QSIS, mm -hmm. right? There, to an extent. <laughs> so then you're then you don't have any um, issues. So yeah. Then everything. Like right. all the computer users, including me, so that's not even that far. So. So Mark, are you much. are you here on behalf of the LBS Church? Yep, Giving machines or what's your? Yeah, we're doing the gift control. Yeah. There you go. And we're doing the gift control. Thanks for doing <laughs> Thomas's Way Community Action. Who are our other ones? Oh, did you find those? Oh, they were oh, good right now. Yeah. Remember the giving machines? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I think being able Thanks for to coming. Have, of course, uh, yeah. So Mark and I serve first term of my um, first four years. 
And how many years were you on council? Was it 14? 14. Man. Oh. You're going to have to How long did you go for? Eight. eight. I thought I might go 12, but it just got a little too uh, four years is kind of a long time. Nasty. I don't know how to say it. How about <laughs> yours? Yeah. Um, yeah. The school district's what was rough. I'm not going to. Hmm. You ever seen such a trouble system? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. Wait, so you're parenting with other? Yes, and can. Oh, cool. Yeah. So here we are. Probably going to be closer to six thirty. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm clock, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm chill. Uh, is Shelly still going to do some um, soccer summer warm fest? Yeah. Or? I'm still doing the warm fest now. Okay. I'm now helping with the parade. Oh, you got the parade. Um, <laughs> one of four. I'm I'm volunteers in garbage. <laughs> I don't know what that means except we always need to Yeah, I think the, I think the old cards were great. Old cards. But didn't they already have two? They had one for you. Well, some of them were small.
Friends in color. So test, test, test. I've got mine. I've got mine. And they were having a little technical. If we have problems, we can go right in each other. Test, test. Might be a little too fast. I want to do it. Ken, we should give you the perfect time to prevent present. I probably have seen you during COVID. You saw your letter. No, no, no. Oh, you're right. Black. 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 You're good at it. Well, you probably see the MFO projects kind of, I don't know if you like having this. You're up in Europe, kind of saying it's the mayor. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem does. Uh, and then the other ones just rotate every six months. Yeah, at this they don't tell us when they were just going to grow up. Still, like this. Exactly. 
<laughs> okay, I took it off. I don't think it's going to show. Oh, yeah. It's a good one. It's a good one. I'd like to call this city council meeting to order and welcome all of you here. We're going to start out with an invocation and a pledge of allegiance. And we've got Ruth Chatterley and Matt Chatterley. And Jeff invited them. So if you'd like to introduce them. Absolutely. Ruth and Matt are dear friends for a lot of years. Uh, they're both Orem High graduates. Uh, they've raised six children, two, uh, four girls and two boys. And uh, Ruth worked at Mountain View High School for 11 years, so as an Orem High graduate, and they also awarded her with a diploma, a graduation diploma from Mountain View, so she can be considered a Bruin and a Tiger. So good for that. Um, Ruth is also the daughter of Stella Welsh, one of our former mayors uh, here in Orem. And Matt, uh, Matt is a talented artist. He had his artwork on display in Library Hall for several months uh, here a few months ago. And uh, honored to, to have them here with us this evening. Thank you, Jeff. So we'll start out with Ruth, if you'd like to come up and give the invocation. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are grateful to be here in this city meeting. We are grateful for the many who have come to Orem in years past and who will yet come. We are grateful for those who have served in the city and those who currently serve and pray with sincerity of heart that they will continue to do so with transparency and honor and integrity. We are grateful, Father, for thy guiding direction Many will come to Orm in future days. Many generations will be blessed by the work that has been done and will be done. And we pray for the foresight and honesty and direction that this council may give and pray for thy guidance and love to be with all the citizens of Orm from whence ever they come and from whatever culture and region they come from that they will have a home and a family here in the city of Orm. We seek thy will in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Ruth. Now Matt will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll now start out with some presentations. This first presentation will be Mark Seastrand, who's going to bring us up to date on the giving machines. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Pleasure to be here tonight. This is a little bit of an annual tradition. Um, uh, every year we do the uh, giving the machine the giving machines at the university mall and uh at the end of the year we like to just have a way to say thanks to so many people that were so involved in the process so this is not a toot your own horn event this is a chance to say thanks to the city council and to orem city and the community as well as to be able to say thanks to some really big uh, important volunteers and organizations that helped make that possible um, this year was our fourth year in Orem. Uh, started in 2019, and we did 2021, 20, 22, and 23. Uh, this year was our best year that we've had in all these years. And the Giving Machine is a program is run by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and has uh, grown to be a worldwide endeavor now that uh, helps and seeks to support and help many people around the world to be able to have a better quality of life and to um, to be able to get some essential elements that they need. Uh, the giving machines this last year were in 61 cities in seven countries, including Canada, Mexico, Guatemala, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines. Hmm. Over 600,000 people participated in giving and donating through the giving machine process. 
350,000 items were donated. 250 local and global nonprofit organizations were involved in distributing these, uh, these necessities. We find that they are closest to the action and by helping them help their constituents is a wonderful way to make the program work. Uh, these, these charities were international as well as local and we were privileged to work with uh, a number of local charities here as well as with a couple of, a couple of international organizations. Um, we wanted to just recognize four kind of groups of individuals or that have been, been associated with, uh, with this. Um, we had a number of local partners that helped make this happen. Our first and foremost is uh, uh, Cindy Nee from the University uh, Place, the University Mall. Cindy, come, I'm gonna have you stand over there. <laughs> The University Mall and University Place, the Woodbury family, Rob Callis, Cindy, uh, Jared, have been super involved in making this a, really the best location in the world for the giving machines. Uh, they supply the power, they supply the internet access, they do decorations, they're there to support with security, they're there to help uh, work with all of the local stores to make sure everything has worked out well. And, and Cindy and her team, we begin the process in July with some fun meetings and start to think about the possibilities and then it executes. And for some reason, working with the University Place just goes without a hitch. And so we wanna just really thank Cindy and the whole University Place team for their efforts in, in uh, joining us in this endeavor. In addition to the University Place, we've had uh, support and help from Marcy Willies, from Needers, from Utah Balloon Company. Uh, you'll notice the wonderful balloon display that has a lot of people getting pictures taken. We've had support from uh, doTERRA, and New Skin, and Deseret Book. Uh, these have all been arranged by various members of our committee, so I wanted to just kind of recognize the other members of the, of the Communication Council that have been involved in, in pulling this together. So we have uh, Val and Nancy Hale. They're gonna be helping hand out some of the plaques tonight. We have Tom uh, Walker, who has helped with the donors and with the volunteers. And then we have John Dye, who also helps with communication and PR in the oh, very yeah. back. And? Jenny. And Jenny, that's what this too. So thanks. And the rights. <laughs> and the rights are, and uh, yeah, Tim and Wendy Wright. So you guys are gonna join us for the picture too in a little bit. We're gonna end up having just a really big picture here up front, if that's okay uh, with you guys. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to thank, so besides the sponsors and all those that, that come to make that work, uh, we have volunteers. Um, the giving machines opened up on November 20th and were in business until January 2nd. Uh, we only missed a couple of days in there, Christmas uh, uh, and uh, New Year's for a couple of, uh, that, that we, or, or Thanksgiving Day actually, I think was the only one that we had off. But to man the machines, we usually had four people there all the time. Uh, Tom Walker was in charge of, and, and Tim Wright were in charge of making sure we had volunteers and coverage. In total, we had 651 volunteers donate many hours, 2,154 hours in making sure people could uh, use the machines in the way they wanted to do and the machines ran uh, uh, faithfully. A lot of those tiles would drop down. We'd have to refill those machines on a regular basis. So I just wanna say thanks to the volunteers for making this work. Also, we had um, a whole bunch of people that came and donated just here in the Orem region. I believe, I can't say this officially, but we were the top in terms of participation, uh, both number of transactions as well as financially. Orem did a wonderful job in getting the word out and getting participation. We had over 18,000 transactions. And those transactions involved many items. And it was, it was wonderful to see the joy and the excitement of the kids and the family as they picked and select the items they wanted to give to someone in need for Christmas. Uh, we had a total of 80,000 participants that, that were part of that 18,000 transactions, and the Orem location did a little over $1,450,000 in donations to the international and to the local charities. So let's hear it for the donors.
we've invited them all to join us also on the oh, just, you know. uh, curiosity how many in the room donated to the giving machines it, it, i mean that's just the the nature of ex and the extent of the of the generous wonderful people here in the community that give freely and then i wanted to now recognize the charities that this is where the real work takes place so we can we can uh, 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 generate the income and, and get the donations, but then giving it off to the charities where they can deliver these goods to the individuals is, is, is pretty significant. So I've asked for a couple of people to help hand these out. We'd like to start off with, uh, is Sam Lee here by chance with Africa? Sam, come on up. Sam is here with our international charity, uh, the African Girls Hope Foundation. If you watch the video, his organization is the one where the, where the young women were dancing and singing in their school uniforms. So we are presenting to, um, to Sam and his organization. The community donated 685 uniforms and 1,447 Chromebooks. So not only can they go to school with the uniforms, they also have technology to really help them advance in their education. So congratulations. To, uh, to the African Girls Hope Foundation, and thank you for the work that you do. And stay up here because you're going to get your picture taken. Well, uh, another one of the international groups that we have that's always kind of interesting is, um, you know, the, the one of the big winners was chickens. So we donated uh, 7,625 sets of chickens. That's off over 15,000 chickens that are going uh, worldwide. I don't know how many goats are in Utah, but I think we're donating all of them. 3,578 are being donated to families in foreign countries to help uh, them build a way to sustain and support their family through goat cheese and through a number of other, other activities. And so that's going to the CARE organization. We also supplied 473 refugee kits blankets and necessities that help a refugee at least get started for a little bit in these foreign countries when they come with basically nothing to have something to work with. So that's with the CARE Foundation. Uh, is Scott Johnson here with the Boys and Girls Club? Great. Scott, we have for you um, 106 after-school support programs for your kids, 1,699 family bonding games to help families join and come together, uh, 3,602 books for reading for kids, uh, 653 experiences with the STEM program, and we have 203 summer camp scholarships to help your young men and young women attend their summer school programs. So a wonderful round of applause for the Boys and Girls Club. We have Tom Hogan here from Community Action Services. Community Action Services, as you know, provides many, many programs, uh, very much involved in the food and in helping those that are in need of the basic necessities. Uh, the community donated uh, 3,921 3, take-home meals for kids after school. And here's the big one, um, 100, or 1,822 sets of 150 meals. So that's really 273,000 meals coming from this organization. So let's hear up for the community action students. Uh, Tabitha's Way is also one of our food organizations. I don't think they were able to make it tonight, but for Tabitha's Way, there was 20. Come on, get on up there, Debbie. This is fantastic. So with Tabitha's Way, uh, they had three items, produce for kids, 2,151, veterans meals. I think it was a month's supply of veterans meals for 1,450 uh, 1, of those. And they're well known for their school uh, backpack supplies that are, that are donated, 2,715 backpack supplies for kids to go to school. So Tabitha's away. Is Ashley Taylor here from The Refuge? Okay. 
The refuge, as you know, works with women and families that have been in abused or battered uh, circumstances. They received a, a significant amount of support to help in their very uh, needed uh, causes. So for after school supplies for young children that have, uh, have gone through some serious domestic challenges, 856 after school supplies, 3,767 blankets and comfort items, kitchens in a box, 568 of those, uh, safe shelters, nights at safe shelters, 542 nights, and then trauma support kits to help the whole family, 817. We greatly appreciate the Refuge Utah and the work that they do. And one of our uh, longtime supporters and help is uh, Bill Holterstrom from the United Way of Utah County. Where are you at, Bill? Come on up. What we love about United Way is they work with 23 other charity organizations. And so under their umbrella, we're able to really leverage additional uh, charities and, and programs to help them uh, be effective. So to the United Way, we have uh, the RAW program, R-A-H, and uh, uh, Cheryl Adamson, I think you're here, right? Come on up, Cheryl. With RAW, the, they received uh, 573 adaptive art supply kits for their, for their adult children, as well as the family respite time of 293 hours of respite time. We also have Family Haven, who is a wonderful organization locally that works with families and mothers. Uh, is uh, Janelle, uh, is it Christensen? Yes. Hey. yes. All right, I got it right. Uh, Janelle and the Family Haven are receiving ab abuse prevention classes, 157 of those, as well as therapeutic books for their clients, 355. And then United Way, in addition to that, is receiving art classes, 686. Hygiene kits, 1,144. Mental support for moms, 533. And new baby kits for those brand new infants, 2,538. In total, uh, over $600,000 worth of goods and services and chickens and supplies went to international. And over $850,000 stayed locally with this wonderful group of organizations. So I really appreciate uh, the work that they do, and I would love to give them a big round of, of applause, as well as have the mayor and council join us for a wonderful picture here in front. Ready, Cedar? Tell us how to get. All right, we're gonna have to squeeze in tight. Ah. Mm -hmm. yes, come Shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. 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 And if Paul would just shake the hand of the mayor and say some great. Yes, please. I'm happy to give him some candy and let you guys go ahead. That'd be great. Thank you for that presentation. The giving machines have a huge impact. We'll move on to item number 6.2. This is a report from the Historic Preservation Commission, and it will be Grant, Grant Allen, Senior Planner, and Olivia Johnson on the Historic Preservation Council. Oh, oh. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we're excited to present. Um, I'm sorry, my name is Grant Allen. I'm the senior planner, um, li staff liaison to this commission. Um, and I've got Olivia Johnson to my left and Devin Pierce, um, our co chair, um, or vice chair, I should say. Um, thank you. Um, here to present um, the activities of this last year of the Historic Commission. So, Olivia, if you want to go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. It's been a busy year for us at the Orem Historical Preservation Commission. We have accomplished a lot, and we have a plan to continue to accomplish a lot for this city. Um, first, it's we are now a certified local government. So the commission is active for the first time in over 10 years. Um, and we were established in January of 2023, or shortly before that, and then... Um, it's designed to promote historic preservation at a local level. This is a federal program through the National Park Service and administrated by the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, which is we call SHPO. Um, and qualified local governments become certified and are eligible to receive matching grants from SHPO, which we are glad to say that we did receive. So in January 2023, the commission applied for a grant with the State Historical Preservation Office, and the grant of $10,000 was granted and was, is going to be used to survey the, a portion of Orem. Um, the area that was decided on is from 800 North to 1600 6, North and between 1200 West and State. Um, also, we are including a special interest in schools in Orem that may qualify for historical preservation. Um, we also have been working a lot with UDOT. UDOT has started the process of expanding 1600. Um, they provided a survey of the houses um, on 1600, but up from between the freeway and up to State Street. Um, allowing for us to remove that area from our um, survey and apply that grant money to another location here in Orem. Um, we are we decided recently that we will be uh, surveying Memo Drive and a portion of 75 East to 800 North, as well as 200 East to 1020 North, including Garden Drive. Um, that area is the area behind Burjado, if you know where that is. Um, and this area will become a new historical dis historical district here in Orem. Um, it was proposed that the area included in Memo Drive um, and the previously mentioned area qualifies to be a historic district. And this area was developed post World War II and sh shows historical relevance to post war Utah and Utah County. Um, so that's very we're very excited to start working on that and getting that designated. We also got to work with the Eva Carlotta Anderson Memorial Garden. It was proposed that uh, a piece of land be developed as a memorial garden um, here in Orem um, because there were pioneer era remains believed to be on the area of um, infant children whose mother had buried them there. And this area will be used to make a memorial garden for women who have lost children and loved ones. Um, we've also discussed the Orem Pioneer Cabin. This one is very fascinating and very interesting to a lot of us. As a lot of us know, um, I believe it was in 2020, um, a Pioneer Cabin was discovered in the walls of a home here in Orem. And it has been put upon us to decide to what extent that cabin is restored and where it shall be located. And we are currently um, exploring nation the National Historic Register for status of the cabin, and it will be placed at his uh, Heritage Park. Um, and we're still discussing ideas as things become um, available to us, if that's where it's going to stay or if it'll be placed somewhere else. Um, our commission, we do have been doing some tours of places in the community so that we can um, get a better idea of what we are trying to preserve here in Orem. We have toured the Orem History Museum, which is an excellent resource here in, that we have um, about our local history. And then we will be touring later this month the Olmsted Power Plant. And we're excited to see what we can learn from these historical sites and how to continue to preser preserve them. And we also are trying to figure out using these tours how to get the community 
further involved in local historical preservation. Okay. Is there any questions from any of the council on any of these items? Deborah, do you have anything to add? I'll say something. So I was on this commission last year, right? Mm -hmm. I saw as you guys um, <clears throat> began the arduous task of creating this commission and identifying what was important in Orem and just building from scratch. And I just, this is fantastic what I see you presenting here because I saw the beginnings, right? Where it was, we were trying to figure out, we knew what we wanted to do, we didn't know how to get there. So thank you for your hard work. This is looks fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation. We appreciate all your all your good work. Next up, we've got item 6.3, and this is the recognition. Uh, thank you to Trader Joe's and Pete Wolfley will present this. I'm going to invite Gina up. She is she knows way more about this, and she's even come with a sign. I brought my own signage. But I did bring the treats, so I should get some credit. Council, Mayor, Council, and all of those wonderful attendees here. I'd like to invite Herbert and Noah up. I'd also like to invite um, Joyce, who is the chairman of our Senior Advisory Commission, Verl Hooley, he is on our commission, and one of our amazing volunteers, Peggy Taylor, come on up. These people know a lot about what we're talking about today. You'll recognize those from Trader Joe's in the amazing Hawaiian shirts. Um, we want to thank them. So what many of you might not know about is uh, we partner with many um, different companies within our community, one of them being Trader Joe's. We also partner with Costco, Macy's Grocery Store, Pizza Hut, Chick-fil-A. Um, say again? Crumble. Crumble. And Crumble Cookie. Sorry. How can I forget them? But... Um, recently, we were we received the paperwork from the Trader Joe's location here in Orem, which if you haven't been there, you should go there, first of all. But they share their products with us, things that maybe are close to date or have damage on them, but are still good. And we set up um, like a farmer's market food shares table Monday through Thursday for the seniors. It's all done by our volunteers. On the weekends, Joyce and her family, um, as well as Peggy, help out um, picking up those donations, separating everything out so that we know what needs to go out on the tables on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and each of our seniors are able to get one bag of groceries every single day for free. And it's because of these uh, companies, and especially Trader Joe's, I need to let you know, in one year, they donated $325,000 worth of product to the Orem Senior Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they realize how grateful we are for that. Um, on average, we give out about 1,200 bags of groceries a month, on average. Now, I know I couldn't get that many signatures on this, but we have this amazing sign for you that so many of our seniors have written their thanks and gratitude, and we hope that you will accept, accept this as a gift from us. We love you guys so much. We're so, so grateful. Would it be all right if we come up for a picture? Yeah. 
One, two, three. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you so much. That's why I'm All right, thank you for that. And thanks, thanks especially to Trader Joe's for those donations. Next up, we've got item 6.4. And this is for the police. And this is BJ Robinson, if you'd like to come up. Mary Young, members of the City Council, uh, citizens that are here and present, it's my pleasure to represent the men and women of your police department here today to recognize our chief, um, Chief Josh Adams. Uh, last month, end of the month, uh, Utah Chiefs of the Police Association held their annual conference, and our chief was nominated and selected as Chief Police of the Year for a large agency. Uh, in part, the nomination highlighted uh, our chief's leadership and uh, focus and care on improving officers as individuals through uh, individual uh, accountability, uh, increasing our uh, department training, um, and with the uh, aid of uh, city and, and you as city council, uh, increased uh, mental health resources to officers uh, and their families. Josh will shrug this off because that's how he is. Uh, he's a good leader, uh, and he will shift the focus to the men and women of the department and say they make him look good, uh, and that is true. Uh, they do. Um, but it's because of the leadership that he provides. Uh, I witness on the daily uh, the toll that it takes, the heavy burdens that uh, he carries, um, and uh, the heavy lifting that he does. And so this award is a very deserving. And uh, so please join me in recognizing uh, Chief Josh Adams as the UCOPA's Police Chief of the Year. And it'll be a little easier if I ask him to come up as a favor to me, uh, if you'll please come up, because I know that uh, he won't do it if, if, I, if, he, if I don't phrase it in that manner. So Chief, if you'll please come up for me and uh, please accept this recognition. Mayor and Council, if I can just say briefly that um, uh, we all know that Chief Adams is the type of person who uh, looks and is very tough, and he also likes to, you know, get the job done in the background. But uh, it truly is an honor to work with him, and he he truly cares. I've loved seeing that. Uh, he's been example to me and to our executive team in how he cares. He takes the time every year to meet one-on-one -on -one with everyone in the department to make sure that, like uh, uh, Chief Robinson mentioned, that they know he cares and that their uh, emotional and mental well-being is, is important and it matters and uh, should be at, at the top of kind of the priority list in how we go about then do, doing um, public safety uh, services. So, so Mayor, I've got a comment. So we know that uh, Chief Adams loves French Bulldogs. And uh, there's an old joke that people resemble their dogs in both looks and characteristics. <laughs> French Bulldogs are Frenchies, or some call them, are exactly playful, alert, and adaptable. They don't bark much, but their alertness makes them excellent watchdogs. 
They can easily adapt to all kinds of different situations. They are highly intelligent, but so incredibly stubborn. All of these characteristics are true, are equally true of our chief. Thanks, chief. Thank you, Brent and Dave. And definitely congratulations to Chief Adams. That's amazing. Let's move on to item number seven, our personal appearances. And tonight we just have one appearance. And this is Tony Kreshner, if you'd like to come up. Hello, Mayor. Hello, City Council representatives. I'm Tony Kretschmer. Many of you might know me as Anthony Kretschmer, a top contributor to the ORM Forum. What's happening in ORM stand for ORM PAC. I'm here today to address you in a very pivotal moment in our school district. We are at a crossroads where we have an opportunity to enact a split upon a district that has grown exponentially bigger, too big for so long that our own Utah legislators have enacted laws to force them to split. I have been a resident of Orem for 30 years. My wife has for more than 50. I chose to move my family here to raise my eight kids in Orem so that they would have the same experience that my wife had going through the Orem Alpine School Districts of yesteryear. That no longer exists. As most of you know, I was a huge supporter of Prop 2. Unfortunately, there was a campaign of misinformation that I feel that caused that to fail. We have the opportunity again because right alongside with Prop 2 failing, Prop 1 failed. And as I mentioned 18 months ago, no general election bond will pass the school district again without a reconfiguration split, period. The Utah state legislators have made it known that it cannot continue to live on lease revenue bonds and arbitrarily raising our property taxes without the consent of the voters. I am urging you in the last minute I have to please seek out an interlocal agreement with our neighboring cities of Linden, of Vineyard, and yes, even Pleasant Grove, because I believe that option four of the MGT education study would be the most beneficial to us. We have students that live in Linden, attend Windsor Elementary, go to junior high in Linden, end up in Pleasant Grove to high school. Let's keep that school clusters together. I am urging you to please seek out the other city councils of Linden, Vineyard, and Pleasant Grove, and let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item number eight, consent items. And on our consent items agenda tonight, we've got approval of meeting minutes for March 12th, 2024 to March 26, 24. We've got item 8.2, a reappointment to the Board of Adjustments of Karen Jeffries. And item 8.3, a reappointment to the Building and Fire Appeal Board for Wilford Whipple. Would someone like to make a motion on that? I move that we approve the consent items. I'll second. Aye. 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 The consent items pass. Thank you. Let's move to item number nine, scheduled items. Item 9.1 is a presentation by the Community Development Block Grant CDBG update. And this will be Heather Cox from the city and Debbie LaRay former council member from MAG, and Ken Ransom, the CDBG chair. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we are here to talk about the most recent meetings we've had for CDBG and our funding recommendations. My name is Heather Cox. I'm a management analyst for the city. And of course, you know, Debbie LeRae, she is our representative at MAG who helps us run this program. And Ken Ransom, he's the chair of our Orem CDBG commission. We have a few new re uh, appointments on the CDBG advisory commission. Stephen Heaps was reappointed, and Scott Snow is a new member of the CDBG Commission. Uh, I'm now the specialist for Orem over CDBG. And Jen is Jen Gill is now our council representative. Uh, historically, our allocations have been about between 600,000 to 700,000. And we've been advised that we will receive approximately the same funding as last year. Um, so, which is a $632,646. Our rollover funding from last year is 30543 So our total estimated funding, uh, this isn't solid. We don't know 100% if this is the exact number, but it will be roughly the same number. It will be so, 600. Say, Heather? Yep. Uh, not to interrupt, but just to clarify, yep. that rollover funding, where does that come from? Um, it was from projects last year that didn't spend their, their total amount. So it was leftover funds from other projects. So with that rollover funding, we'll have 663189 Yep. So the Congress just passed um, the bill that would, that would include this money, and it was on March 5th. They have 60 days to get us the final numbers. So we're hoping by the beginning of May we will know the exact amount. But until then, we are, they, we've been told by HUD to just use what we had last year. It'll be very similar. And after our 30-day comment period, we will have another presentation at the end of May. So we'll have, we should have that final number for that final presentation. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Ken and he's going to go over our um, spending. Thank you, Heather. Good to be here before you again, uh, Mayor and Council members, representing the our city's advisory commission for D CDBG. And I'll run over the uh, the numbers that we're recommending. And just want to thank first our council, or excuse me, our commission members. Thank our commission members for their service and for uh, helping us out with this project. And thanks to these two as well. And uh, just want to mention too that I, uh, Joey, Elise, and I served represented Orem on the joint commission, and just wanted to let you know that that's a difficult process to go through because they're asks. These are great organizations that do great things for our community, and they need far more money than we can give them. And so we try to stretch those dollars as far as we can when we make these recommendations. All right. So the the first one, Orem Police Department Victim Services. This is an Orem only project. We're recommending thirty thousand. And this uh, would assist with the salary for an advocate working with victims of domestic violence. And the next one is also an ORM only project uh, for the Department Homeless, the ORM Police Department's Homeless Services. That helps uh, our uh, officers help homeless make the next step toward uh, improving their lives. And we think this is a worthwhile as well. And we recommend this be funded as well. Uh, the next three are joint. These are uh, public service joint funding recommendations. Uh, the first is for community action home buyers. Orem residents take these classes and have the opportunity to improve their chances to, to uh, purchase a home. And these, we recommend that this be funded at $10,000. And Kids on the Move, we're all familiar with that organization, benefits many of our Orem residents. Uh, we are recommending $10,000 for their Head Start Nutrition Program. Yes. I, I know you're gonna go through several sheets. Are these all similar to what we've offered in previous years, or could you tell us if there's a, delta, a significant delta change as we go through these? Well, the, our funding recommendations do change a little bit, and you might want I to guess I just want to know about major changes. Thank you. The joint funding on the regional level, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the same ones are funded, but there were also more that asked this year. There were specifically more capital asks. On the ORM only level, it is Mostly the same. There were two projects last year that were um, one-time projects that are, have dropped off. 
So we are doing all of the same things as last year on the ORM only level, and we are adding one project, which is the ORM senior uh, flooring project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then do you have a percentage mm -hmm. breakdown for ORM only or joint that you have to follow or? Yeah, and that's gonna come up on a future okay. slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And any other questions before we, all right, we'll jump back in. And so the, the final one on this uh, slide, the Food and Care Coalition, again, that's a joint uh, that we're funding with our partners, Provo and Utah County and MAG. Um, these recommend 15,000 to fund meals for low-income residents in Orem. So next slide, please. And these are public services uh, recommendations again. These are all joint recommendations. So Community Health Connect, they connect uh, medical professionals who are willing to donate their services to those in, who need those services, can't pay for them on their own. We recommend 15,000. Uh, Family Haven, Utah Valley, formerly Utah Valley Family Support, we recommend $32,264. This, those costs go to help with therapy costs for them. And Big Brothers, Big Sisters, recommend $10,000 funding allocation for them to help with their mentoring with youth programs. And the final one, Food and Care Coalition, we recommend $15,000 for their program costs for low-income residents in Orem for meals. So that total is $95,160 and some change. Next slide, please. And these are non-service, non-public service recommendations. Uh, the first one is the City of Orem's uh, administration costs, which um, go to Orem and for, for MAG, Mountain, Mountain Land Association of Governments. So that recommendation is 126,529. And this next one, the City of Orem, it's a economic development loan payment that to my understanding is will be paid off very soon. Heather can confirm that. This is our last payment. So that 99,000 will be freed up next year. And uh, the rest, so City of Orem Code Enforcement uh, helps to fund a full-time officer working with target neighborhoods uh, with code enforcement. We recommend this be funded at 161500 And then for the Orem Critical Home Repair and Home Rehabilitation Fund, we recommend the 56729 And... For the City of Orem Neighborhood Preservation, we recommend 30,000 for their fund their events and activities during the year that they uh, that the city holds in the in the uh, it neighbor in the neighborhoods that meet the criteria. And Heather re referenced this earlier, so the city has notified us that they have a need to replace the flooring in the senior center. So we recommend this be funded at the re um, estimated cost of $30,998. And our final recommendation uh, for you is the refuge. They are um, building a new shelter in Orem and we recommend that this be funded at $63,265. And the total you can see there, $663,189 and, and $1 is our, that um, is our budget. What's the infrastructure for the, the refuge is getting? It will include things um, like utilities coming, utility lines, things like that, as they um, prep for that bit, new building. So water, sewer, electrical. Does that impact fees at all, or just kind of the, the general utility running the lines? Is... Um, Jessica, do you remember? Yeah. I know that they asked for um, 200000 and um, so the total ask will be, and you'll see that on the... The um, regional one. Is that the thing on 8th North and State, right? Yeah. The women's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it's toward the end. So it'll be a great asset to Orem. How, how does the, that uh, crit critical home repair and home rehabilitation, uh, mm -hmm. how's that managed? And the reason I ask is because we're going through a process where we're, we're looking at doing a lot of volunteer efforts and we're looking mm -hmm. at code enforcement and we're trying to marry that all together. I'm just curious how this would fit into that. Yes, so we usually um, provide funding through the ORM's CDBG allocation to that. Uh, however, this year, we, instead of doing the full $100,000, we cut it down to fifty six dollars because it is a revolving loan fund and we never seem to spend it all. And with this um, senior center flooring project being a, top, uh, a big priority, we've allocated some of that money to, money to the senior center flooring project. Um, 
So that's a 0% interest deferred loan payment. And we continue to work with MAG, actually. We're going to move forward working with MAG um, to be able to administer that program. I'm, I'm just curious about that one because it, mm -hmm. it might get a lot more visibility with the path we're going down as far as funds that could use to be available. Okay. And saying that um, once that loan is paid off, that Section 108, next year, if, if the need is there, you could certainly transfer some of that 99000 down to, to critical home repair following year. So, you know, if, if you want to look and see what the demand is for this year. Okay. And and, but, other... that, but that was 100000 Yes. We moved it to 56, but that was because there wasn't enough demand. Yes. So the, the, we never use up, we usually use up roughly, well, from what I can tell, um, half of that critical home repair budget. And we still have citizens paying back into that as they're selling their homes and moving out. Uh, they, they have to pay back their loan. So okay. we, we aren't using all of it. I, I talked with Brandon Nelson about it and he said, you know, we really don't need to put a full 100,000 into that. Um, the other nice thing is that the senior center flooring project is only a one-time project so that 31,000 can go back into the critical home repair program next year if we okay. need additional. I could, I could just see this. And I, I think you're fine where you're at now, but I can see mm -hmm. this as we move forward with this project that using that entire 100,000. Yeah. And that's my question. Can you amend this into the future? Mm -hmm. It looks like we have those needs. Yep. Oh, can we oh, that? Oh, if we have the funds. Oh, right. But I mean, if we can switch the funds before we don't have, we're not tied to this. Once the funds um, come these out. Will be, these numbers will be, once we know the exact number from HUD, we will do contracts with these, these amounts in them. And so um, in order to get, we'd have to do an amendment to the sub, sub recipient agreement and there have to be some, either something that went lower, um, but the total still has to be the same. Okay, and fiscal year 2025? Starts July 1 and it's June 30th. Oh, perfect. So, so July. it follows the city fiscal year then? Yeah, right? it, yes, yes, correct. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Is, are we acting on this today or just hearing about it today? Just hearing about it. Because I know you like to come a half dozen times before we actually vote, Kent. Yeah. It would be helpful if you would send out to us last year's budget, last year's grant, this year's request, and current year proposal. If you could send that out electronically, then we could A, B what they've been given in the past and we'd have a better understanding. Would that be, is that easy to do? Someone in county can do that for us, Brent? I've made note and we'll, we'll do it. Thank That's you. Fine. It looks good. I, I just can't remember everything we did a year ago, and so that would be helpful if I had that in front of me when it is time to vote on the issue. Well, happy to provide that for you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this regional committee, which Ken and Joey were part of. Um, there were 24 applicants. Um, they were all very good projects. We flushed them all out. We asked for um, a lot of money, of which we only have 680,000 to distribute between Provo, Orem, and Utah County. And what we did is, um, after we had figured out the total amounts that each, each um, usually it's a 10% give out of their public service part, and, and there was also this year, uh, we talked to you about the capital projects, that was another 10%. We didn't always have those capital projects, but just know the Food, Food and um, Care Coalition, needed new flooring down in Provo, and the refuge course here in Orem asked for 200,000, so 100,000 asked from, we also had a third one, Fit to Recover, which did not get funding this year. So um, we had quite a few. How we determined Orem's, um, Jessica, you've, many of you know my boss, Jessica and I, we went through each of the projects and we, we looked at the different beneficiaries from each community. And one of the reasons that we assigned these, is these particular um, um, services, whether it was Kids on the Move, you know, community health, all of these are ones. They had a strong percentage of Orem residents who were utilizing. So that was one of our decision make years of how we assigned it. We still had to get to this number of the 126. And if you can see like Family Haven, um, Pro had to take some, we had to take some. But the other ones were based on just beneficiaries of our Orm citizens. So we feel good about that. And um, and we feel like this was a this this was an abnormally high ask year with 24 projects. We don't usually have that many, and we were happy to find 18 of the 24. So, any questions on that? Okay. Also, I think it's important to note that this year we received more asks of for capital projects, which we didn't last year, and so that dipped into our overall funding as a city. Um, the joint. Funding also dug into our, our funding. Um, 
So our total recommended allocation is 663,189 and a little bit of change. The next steps is we have the open, we, the open the public comment period for funding recommendations. In May, after public comment is closed, at the end of May, um, we will come back again and you will vote on our recommendations. Any questions? Any questions? Can, can you give us a little bit of detail on, on how it works from management perspective, perspective? In other words, you gather all the data and now you decide where the funds are going. And then is there an ongoing process where all these different people you're giving money to have to be interacting with you on an ongoing basis or how does that work? Sure. So we did have um, the city prepared recommendations. I, I believe you talked to uh, Bryn and whoever else uh, department heads to kind of get the idea of what the city's priorities were. And then we had, of course, the community regional um, meeting, which we had two representatives on. And so they, they decided the regional give. And one of the advantages is that so these organizations don't have to go to Provo and the county and us. So it's, it's been a good thing. Ongoing, we, we prepare contracts and then quarterly they'll be submitting their draws to us at MAG and we will double check receipts. And then we work with Heather and Brandon um, to the MAG, if they're an organization like, let's say Kids on the Move, we pay that and then you reimburse us. But things like our admin, you, 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 reimburse, re, you reimburse directly and then your ORM only projects, you just transfer funds, I believe, between different accounts to, is that how it works? Transferring funds from one, like say, to the senior center or to the, you know, the, the neighborhood resource. We, we approve it with the federal funds through HUD and, and then. Yeah, we make sure that our finance director is involved in doing the proper fund accounting and transfers uh, through the process. Right. But I do, re I do um, prepare the vouchers. They're called an IDIS voucher. And then I send those um, to Heather and Brandon for their approval. And then they approve them. And then that's how they get the funding from the federal government is through that system. There's also a lot of reporting required. So we have to gather um, numbers on who's being served. Um, <laughs> their CDBG has many, many requirements uh, on the federal level. So we have to report on how many people were, who were served, uh, what demographics they fill. And one another thing to note about critical home repair is that we have an application process through the ORM website. So anyone who needs a home repair, they have to go through a pretty lengthy process. And I think this may play into why we don't spend all this money um, because these individuals have to prove that they make less than 80% AMI. Um, that is a CDBG requirement that's put on us. Uh, they also have to prove that they are basically strapped for funds. Um, so many people who receive these funds are either elderly or disabled, uh, or they live in one of our CDBG designated um, neighborhoods, but they have to prove that they make less than 80% AMI. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty difficult process. Then it goes to our loan committee here in Orem, and they they have to also go through all of the applications and approve um, whether they can have those funds. So then they, we do reporting on that end as well. Make sure that do, everything do you is think it, Do you think, just curious, do you think it's a reasonable process for them to go through? I mean, um, or is that why it's so hardly any money is going out? You know, I think it is reasonable because we are held to federal standards about who we give money to. And they basically have to prove that they meet those standards. Um, so for example, sometimes, you know, I've, I've, gone through an application where she did, you know, someone did technically meet those out qualifications, but they they had other means to pay for mm. a, and, and there were other applicants who were elderly or who you just need, we felt need the funds more. Mm -hmm. so. If you, if you loan, I mean, say you loan to some, uh, one who's elderly mm -hmm. and they pass away, do, do you have like a lien that repays that we money? We do put liens work? on, on the home. So once they pay back those funds, we reconvey those deeds, but, um, do you know what happens when that has happened before? And I think we just, I believe we just turned it into a grant at that point because mm. there's no way. Yeah. We do try to put a lien if they sell the home. Um, but if they continue to live there, you know, until someone dies, um, you know, we'll, we'll be reasonable with that. Yeah. Um, I did want to bring up, um, our director of family Haven, um, she is someone who will be benefiting from this, and I'd love to hear um, from her on what these grants mean and, and how it benefits Orem residents. Thank you for coming. 
Thank you so much, Debbie and Council and Mayor for allowing me to take a minute to speak tonight. Um, my name is Janelle Christensen and I've been with Family Haven on and off in different positions for 15 years now, six of those as the executive director. And these programs mean so much to our community. I mean, it is so cool to me to see this list and kind of get goosebumps to see all the good that's happening and to just be a small part of um, that, that story. Uh, the population that we serve is primarily victims of child abuse or trauma with these funds and people like they described in these other uh, these other line items who don't have access to those services by any other means. You know, they're demonstrating a real need uh, when they walk through our doors. And when we, what we know about uh, the, the things that these children are experiencing is that it really changes the trajectory of their lives, right? So when we can intervene early, when we can find that resilience, the average number of sessions that a child needs is 16 versus an adult who's then coping with it is four to five years. And so these funds make a huge difference in being able to support them when they need it and change the trajectory for them for the rest of their life. And then that leads to obviously societal benefits and things like that. Um, I just have one quick story I wanted to share from a mother daughter who was able to use these funds this last year after learning that her 12 year old daughter had been sexually abused by her grandfather and they had no other way to access, access care for her. And this is the story. This is her mother's words. She said, I used family Haven for therapy for me and my daughter as I was dealing with going to trial against my mom's second husband. I had hit rock bottom and experienced extreme depression and severe anxiety. Going to therapy at family Haven was the thing that helped me from losing my helped keep me from losing my mind. I was going for a year on a weekly basis. And if it hadn't been for the grants, I wouldn't have been able to get the help I needed. I'm so grateful for this wonderful resource that was there for me when I was going through the worst crisis of my life. My daughter also used family, used therapy at Family Haven when she hadn't opened up to anyone what had happened to her since it went to court. It was only through that with fam, that care with Family Haven that she was able to speak about her trauma and face it in a courtroom. The grants to get her the much needed therapy were a godsend. We went in as victims and came out as victors. Thank you, Family Haven. And really thank you to you, to CDBG, to this program, because when she references grants, this is what she means. This is what allowed her and her family to find that hope and healing that they so desperately needed. So thank you for your consideration, for your support in the past, and for the difference that this makes in our community. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Any other questions? I'll say one thing. <clears throat> I know that our, our Miss Orem, or Miss Orm Natalie Green, um, that's her platform. Is the the for the getting victims of abuse to where they can get the need, the things that they need, and the therapy that they need. And I really appreciate what you're doing because it does make a huge effect. Um, get that happening now, right on their entire life, so they can overcome. Thank you so much for that. And we will get those numbers for past last year's funding and this year's funding for comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much for letting us come and present, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay, next up we've got item 9.2. This is a rezone enacting Article 12-11-66, uh, a PD-53 zone and Appendix OO of the Orm City Code and amending Article 22-5-3 and the zoning map of the city of Orem by rezoning the property located generally at 1960 North State Street from the C2 zone to the PD53 zone. And Matt, if you'd like to present that to us. And what, uh, yeah, if you'll present, then we'll have a public hearing after that. Uh, now it is. Thank you. <laughs> this is a rezone, a request from the applicant. Uh, essentially, what it does is adopts a brand new zoning district. 
uh, for an area of uh, Orem that we'll cover. Um, and we'll go over the reasons for that. And that zoning district will facilitate the proposed concept plan that the developer applicant has put forward. The subject property is located uh, on the intersection of 2000 North and State Street. It's uh, where the Needers currently is in Sweeto Burrito. There's a former grocery store that's been vacant for some time on the property. The current zoning is the C2 zone. And the proposal, though, is to rezone that as a PD53 zone. As I mentioned earlier, a brand new zone that would facilitate this development. Uh, with all PD zones, a concept plan is adopted. And this concept plan governs um, the development of final plans and is also required by the PD zone that uh, any future development will more or less comply with the conceptual plan and all our other zoning regulations and development regulations. And what we see here is a, a perspective view from State Street towards, uh, from the south uh, of the site, southwest, and looking actually towards the northeast. I think probably should be in the background there, but um, we have here two office buildings in the, for, um, well, sorry, in the forefront, a drive-through facility. Um, two three-story office buildings, and then if you could look at the far left of the screen, um, behind the existing needers, a, a, a two-story office. Uh, and, and I misspoke. These are office-slash-retail mixed-use facilities. Here's the site plan that gives you a little bit more context. Uh, State Street's on the south side of that, and um, north would be actually oriented a little more to a 45 degree angle, but this fits better. The site plan, uh, yes, sir. Yes. Would you go back to that slide you mm -hmm. just on? So down, so Neaters, existing building. Correct. Um, that, right to the right of it, that's the entrance off State Street. Is that correct? To right. the right of it, yes. Okay, thank you. There's a, one other existing building I failed to mention that's right behind um, Sweeto Burrito on the corner of 2000 and State. It's a two-story, um, I believe, office type use. We have detailed site plan data so talking back, about- Back to that slide just a second. Yes, sir. So the very bottom is State Street? Yes. Okay. And the um, left of the screen would be 2000 North. Okay, thanks. We do have some data that we can refer back to if we need to about the gross floor areas, the parking stall count. Um, these will be tied to the conceptual plan and be required to guide the development. Mm -hmm. and, you, any, and, you said yes, those, and you said those are a mixed uh, retail on the yes. bottom and then- So the main up. floor is retail uh, potential. I think they might have some flexible flexibility there between retail or office, depending on market demand. Mm -hmm. But the um, second and third stories are programmed for office space uh, exclusively uh, per these layouts here. That, that's what makes sense. However, um, they being in the PD zone, um, there is a land use table. And I can actually look at that when we have Q&A and just verify mm -hmm. if it's um, limited to just those two type of uses. Okay, thanks. So these are building elevations. Um, they show the floor plates, uh, the first through third floor, as well as the elevations of the buildings. They're uh, similar in nature. And then the one to the north is, like I said, two stories. Some other perspective views uh, of the conceptual plan. Uh, this makes it a little bit clearer, especially in the bottom left-hand corner, that retail element. There's also a little plaza in between the two buildings, which I think is a nice addition. Okay, this is the existing site conditions. 
as I said, there's a, a former grocery store that's been vacant for some time. And then you can see Neater's off there in the uh, upper left, uh, Sweeto behind that that beautiful fall tree, I think. As, as I looked color. at this before, during the stuff you sent out, it looked like Neaters was going to remain in the sweet old sweet burrito, or am I might yeah, be blowing correct. it? Those two buildings would stay. The rest would be raised. There's an additional building behind sweet old burrito that would remain. It's a small building, right? It's a two-story, right? smaller building, about 6,000 square feet, I believe. Combination office, I think. And, yeah. Okay. Thank the, you. The main building to be raised would be the grocery store. Right. Thank you. We, uh, with all PD zones, we have a governing ordinance that would be adopted as part of this. There are some exceptions. This is really very similar to the C2 zone. Um, the, uh, my understanding of why the applicant has proposed a PD zone is for a few exceptions. Overall, this will be in line with the general development of the corridor. It's not particularly uh, divergent in any significant way. Uh, from what's uh, allowed already on the site by the current zoning. Uh, but they did ask for a few um, variations, and hence, therefore, we have the specialized zone that would allow those variations. Uh, typically, we have a 15-foot setback from the sidewalk, uh, the back of the sidewalk um, on State Street. They're asking for 10 feet. That allows them to... Um, uh, maximize some parking space uh, and to get their numbers close to where they need to be. Also allows for a drive-through to go through on that um, retail pad site. Uh, yes. Is there gonna be a, I'm trying to look. So how does that building on the south, the drive-through line up with Neaters, the setback for Neaters, do you know? It's a behind it. I'm not sure how many feet. Okay. Uh, I would guesstimate it's at least 10 feet behind the current eaters. Behind but they the have eaters. that drive through that goes in front of it, and that impedes into the landscaping area that we would normally require. Okay. But visually, it will be. Visually, yes. So as it will far be as within the, the 15 feet. Correct. Um, other than that, setbacks uh, remain. Uh, equal to the C2 zone. And then the building heights, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're, they're equal, right, Ryan? Yeah, to the current C2 zone. Landscaping, I uh, already mentioned the uh, deviation there. Um, they do request for slight, slight parking reduction uh, rather than one stall for 250 square feet. Um, to allow one stall per 255 square feet. And um, this allows them to lay out the parking and the buildings in the way that they desire. Um, there is a difference between buildings less than 10,000 square feet, uh, where the standard is based upon total gross fo square footage uh, versus buildings larger than 10,000 square feet, which is based off a leasable square footage standard. So uh, stairways, uh, foyers often aren't part of the leasing package and therefore they're excluded from the overall calculation. Matt, so, what, what, yeah. what would be the net difference in parking spaces if we grant that variance? Um, Ryan, do you have the number on that? Yeah, it's, a, that. it's depending on how you round, it's between seven and eight stalls. For the entire project, correct? That's correct. And then the is, can you, I'm, I'm curious, why were the trees um, reduced? Um, we do have the developer here that could probably answer some of those questions okay. better if the mayor's interested in inviting him up, if that's okay with the mayor. We're almost well, done when with the presentation. We'll come up. Yeah. Um, one advantage, uh, we recognize there's some trade offs with the proposal, especially with like reducing the landscaping on. Uh, State Street, but uh, staff ultimately recommended to the Planning Commission an approval. Uh, one of the main advantages is they've come forward with a solid concept, and by rezoning to PD, that actually bounds them to the concept rather than, um, you know, that design shifting and morphing to something unexpected in the future. There was some concerns in the Planning Commission meeting. Ultimately, the Planning Commission did recommend approval on a five to one vote. 
um, to that recommend to you that you approve it. Uh, there was concerns about the height and the view shed from the residential area to the east of the grocery store. This is a street view from Google Earth or Google Maps showing the existing condition of the back of that grocery store. You see how it's only about 12 feet off the property line. Yeah, I estimate about 20 feet tall. That's an estimate. I didn't get my measuring tape out. Um, but um, you can see just sort of how imposing that is. And just to provide some context, there were some concerns expressed from the public about the view shed of the three-story office buildings. They will be 100 feet from the property line rather than 12. And then um, I just sketched this out today just to help illustrate that um, the view shed doesn't significantly change. It actually slightly improves a little bit with that three-story 100-foot offset. Um, and it's a much more attractive facade than the cinder block wall. So hopefully that adds some more context about the, the, the view impact. Now that's for properties immediately adjacent to the grocery. There are some further south that don't have any obstruction in their view shed and a new office building would, would uh, provide some obstruction. But again, uh, it's a, it gives you some more context. Uh and that particular height is currently allowed under a C2, correct? Correct. So, so it, yeah, they could apply under the current C2 rules and, and it would still, still be that be height yes. within 100 feet of the property. Correct. And again, to your point earlier, we know what we're getting when they start with this PD zone and you don't know what they're getting when you start with a C2 zone. Correct. Which is probably why you and the Planning Commission recommended approval. Uh, Yes. Added to the... At least the staff yeah. level. Yeah, I'm Thank sure you. the planning commission, each member have maybe a little different take on it, but um, from the staff perspective, yes. And, and is that the same? The C2 is 100 feet, just like the PD? Or is the C2 different? I do feel, uh, if I remember correctly, we do allow buildings closer than 100 feet, but they have to be shorter down to 35 feet. And, and I do think they're allowed up to zero feet from the property line. Is that right? I have to go review the code on it's that It's one again. to one, 10 with a difference of ten, uh, beginning at 10. So 35 feet, oh, okay. you could be 35 feet tall, 48, 48, but yeah. the, the tallest is 35 at 35. Thank you for that clarification. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. I love it when you quote code. <laughs> <laughs> she just did circles around. Oh, can I ask one question? <laughs> yes. And maybe you're going to show this, but um, so the office space, so floor two and floor three. Yes. So when you say office, um, my impression is whoever's occupying that will likely be gone at five or six p.m. Yeah, is, typically you, that is, uses, is that, that is accurate? around standard operating around office use. However, I don't think we have any zoning regulations that say an office couldn't be open later. You know, um, right? Like after hours. And again, that's why I need to go look at that land use code because if they had, like, say, a spa or salon in there and they operated later hours, you know, okay. uh, we wouldn't prohibit that. Okay. Thank you. So ultimately, uh, the planning commission did uh, recommend the city council by ordinance enact these provisions of code as outlined on the agenda. If there's any questions for me and. I do want to ask the applicant about the trees. Let's go ahead and invite the applicant up. Or do you want to wait till public comment is done? No, you can trees okay. come, on. come on up. Thanks for meeting with us tonight. My name is Dave Vincent. I'm one of the partners and represent the partnership uh, putting forth this uh, request. Um, the main reason for the tree request was because it matches what is already there. Um, the existing trees, which are quite large, full mature trees. Um, so tearing those trees down would actually reduce the amount of landscaping and the coverage that is there existing along Sage Street. So you're looking just to supplement that same look that's already there? Correct. Okay, thank you. Can you go? Uh, David Vincent and then our lead architect, Justin Hepler. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David Vincent and Justin Hepler with AJC Architects. Could you could you just go back to kind of the pros and cons sheet?
pros and cons. Well, I was just talking about the pros and the cons. Yeah, the two. The differences between the two zones. And there's two slides on this. So, so the, qu the question I have is, you have the total square foot of the feet of the new building, but the parking, I'm assuming is my concern, that you have Neaters and Sweet Burrito, and you're gonna utilize those parking stalls as the total amount for the retail and the office space? So, so ahead, originally we were, um, we've been working with staff on this um, for over two years. And the original approach was we were going to look at this, the rezone in isolation um, with uh, Suido Burrito broken out and uh, Neaters, the existing Neaters building broken out as separate parcels. Um, they recommended that we instead rezone the whole property that's owned by Neaters. And so at that point, we did combine those totals into the parking counts, but the parking counts worked before when they were independently uh, broken out as their own parcels. So we, we didn't change anything to do with our parking count. We just ended up looking at the site more holistically. Um, so we're not dependent on the parking from those sites um, to make this work. Now we are blending a little bit of Neater's existing, they, they, ended up, they end up using some of that existing parking field because they're so busy, but they meet their requirements within with, with the, within what they have available on their parcel. So, so with your new building, you're saying that you have enough parking. If we do the PD zone, and you go down to two fifty five per. So with with our new buildings, we have enough parking that with with when the whole site's considered as a whole, we work. If you broke out meters and. Sweet burrito as separate parcels, it still it still works. And and, and if we want to get into a, a analysis of the parking, we can do that. But, yeah, that's that's my main concern okay. because with Sweet Burrito and Neaters, if they're packed, where are people going to park if it's so if there will be a cross share that happens um between uh all of the different parking available on the site. But that's one of the benefits of a mixed use development is you can do that flex up and down um, within a larger parking field. So um, we anticipate that uh, there likely will be a little bit of an overflow into that uh, front parking area when Neaters is super busy at noon, but also um, the office will likely park primarily around the office building to the south side, uh, to the north side, and they'll kind of blend a little bit. They'll tend to park close to the to their office up at kind of the east side of that that parking field. And that should lead plenty of parking available for needers to kind of bleed into there and the um re the what we anticipate to a restaurant pad to kind of bleed into there. So I we don't anticipate any challenges managing the, the parking on the site between all the buildings. And and we've been working with Peg Development, who does a lot of um development of large um multi um use projects like this and in they're very comfortable with our parking field. So so what plans? I mean, I've been there. I've been to Neaters at noon. Yeah. What plans do you have for the drive up? Because it so it doesn't block. Yeah, the parking. So we're actually working to solve a current drive through mm -hmm. issue with the way that we have our new configuration. Currently, it's a single lane and yeah. the per, we're proposing two lanes. Yeah. And they also are kind of. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to solve a problem right now. Also, as we readdress this parking lot. Yeah, because that's a problem right now. Yes, it's a problem. I can't, if you park and someone's in the drive that you can't, and you go inside, you can't get out of your parking spot. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. If we, if we didn't, if we had been able to move the State Street entrance, we probably would have pushed it a little bit further south, but we don't have any option with that. So we're, we're, we're working with this as it is. Because of you guys. Yeah, it's very complicated. Yep. So Matt, can you go back to the, um, the, Pros and cons, whatever the positive or negative. Yeah, right here. Again, there's two slides. So if you'd like me to look at the other, just. Because C2, that's, 
That's basically four per 1,000, which is 2.5, 2, 2 and you want 2.55. I'm just concerned about the parking. That's my main concern. Also, like with apartments, it's the same thing. We, um, so. now, one thing that uh, the planning staff might want to address is um, without the rezone, we still would be able to come in and ask with a parking study for a parking reduction. We likely would be asking for the same amount of stalls as a parking reduction, and staff has the ability to consider that and weigh that with the parking study. If you look at the parking study that's attached to the proposal, they actually think that we're overparked for what our use is going to be, and they have a lot of analysis that that demonstrates that. Um, so, uh, I don't believe, and staff can respond uh, that we're asking for something that we otherwise couldn't ask for without the rezone. We just are we're just locking it in with the plea, with the PD development. So what, what, what is the total square footage? So my screen froze up. I, I have that councilman. Um, the new square footage is 88,150. The existing is 10,540 for a total of 98,690. And David, do you mind if I ask a question while you're considering, are you in the middle of something? I don't want to interrupt. You go for it. The type of client you're going to have in here for the, and I know you're representing the developer, you're the architects. The type of clients you're going to have in here are going to be more professional versus a call center versus some other thing that would demand high parking. Correct. I'm sure you don't have your, all your, any of your contracts ain't, but who are you shooting for? What type of people? We've already had uh, conversations with dental, dental offices, medical insurance, um, who are going to be light users as far as parking. So having had some experience with commercial real estate, four to a thousand is plenty. And you're talking about a total net difference of seven or eight parking stalls on the yeah, 88,000. So it's, it's small. It's a relatively minor thing. And if you're not doing call centers, I'm feeling very confident and it doesn't look like the architect lends itself to a call center because they're yeah. not big flat floor plates with, the 30,000 foot floor plates, right? Breaks up really well in four quadrants per floor. And that's, that's what, that's the client. For professional offices. Yes. Yeah. 2,500 to 5,000 square feet. Yeah. That's going to be your current client, your go-to client, 5,000 square feet. And in the much. office world right now, that's what sells. <laughs> the, the large. Is selling these yeah. as condos? No. No. Well, okay. No. When you that's say what, sells, I was rent, just, that's yeah, what thank you. As well. Yes. Yeah. Lease as well. So if, you're, if, if you're going to have professional office, like you say, that really does open up the parking because it's just, it's not that big of a use. Don't have four feet. Well, and yeah. it, it, no, and it changes all the time and it's just, yeah, well, we, and we've you always might, got plenty of room. You know, the doctors close down for lunch and right. so maybe that frees up parking spots for needers yep. during the lunch hour. When so, also they go home at five or, or six. they go home at five, know, so, so the that dinner. that opens that up for dinner. Yeah. A question maybe more for Ryan. Um, along State Street, is that curbed? Is that red curbed? If there was a massive wave of lunch goers, what's, what does State Street look like as far as parking on along State for a short period of time? There, there is a shoulder there right now, and it looks like you can park there. There is a bike lane shown. Um, but it's not red curbed. In the 25 years that I've been there, I've never seen a single car park there. Well, no. it's, it's a vacant lot. <laughs> no, yeah, that's true too. So, yeah. yeah. But I don't see parking on State Street. Yeah. I think, I think on, the only on time On the that other was... side of State Street, there's a there, there's a housing development and there's parking on that side. There, there's a the, um, medical question. clinic and a, a retirement home. I just think directly across parking street. on State Street is never a good plan yeah. from yeah, the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mayor, I stand corrected. There are no parking signs designating it as a bike lane. I just had to look a little closer at the Google Street View. Thank I, you. I just went along to go into it with the, that being part of the plan. We need to park it on the on the property. What's your overflow plan for? I'm guessing you're putting a swig there on the corner. But <laughs> <laughs> what's your overflow so plan? There? We actually worked. We did a lot of work to get that um, drive through to configure right. But you entered the drive through from uh, the internal. Uh, there's an easement that has to be maintained between the lot to the south and across the site. And so you enter from that easement easement vehicle lane and and we feel like that's gonna keep all that overflow traffic internal to the site. Yeah. And then here's my next question. So exiting from that area, your traffic study, 
Um, are you looking at some traffic control devices somewhere? It's pretty tricky to get out of there. You're, incre you're increasing the activity in this parcel of land a lot. And I know, you know, coming out and trying to make us turn south, did they recommend any kind of so um, the, the, controlled the intersection? The parking or? study didn't recommend it. I mean, right turn is always going to be easier than left turn. Um, I, that's not something that uh, we're proposing currently. Uh, we'd be more than open to your perspective on that if you wanted to try to regulate that. But right now, um, we don't have any plans to uh, regulate that. Yeah. So. It's really not us. It's you, Doc. Right? right. That would, yeah. and they haven't. Well, we haven't done our full submittal to them, so that could come back out okay. of that process um, as we Sorry, move yeah. on with development. So, okay. Did you ask what the, you know, what what you could have in a PD fifty three? What are the uses? It's gonna be the same as the C two for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the actually, same as the C two. It's the zone. same as any use that's allowed in a C two zone right now. So there's like a thousand uses. So, so to show so you the table would probably not be very helpful. We're basically talking about eight less parking spots and five feet closer to State Street. Everything else stays pretty much the same. Is that fair? Right. That's fair to say. And how many of those could the state could the staff have done? Could I mean, the staff have approved those without a PD change? No. Without a zone change? No, we could not. Um, the you could have waived the parking requirement, but not the move to State Street? We could not waive either one of them. Okay. And, and the gentleman at the table suggested a parking reduction study. That is an option to pursue if it were not to be rezoned. But staff doesn't approve that. It goes through a different approval process. And Steve and I can't recall off the top of our heads. It just goes to Planning Commission for approval on a parking reduction study. Thank you. And with that setback going from 10, going from 15 to 10, I mean, normally I think we care about that, but because this is already, everything's set so far back, it has that nice open look. So it's pretty insignificant. Yeah, and I, going back, I, I've worked with uh, Mr. Vincent on this. About seven years ago, we started having discussions and that road, that easement that he talked about kind of locks that parking field in place. And so if you did have that extra five feet, it kind of squishes the parking up to the building and the drive aisle doesn't work out very well. So, so again, your sidewalks don't line up, right? Cause you're yeah. correct. So, so right okay. now the sidewalk in front of Neaters doesn't line up with the sidewalk that uh, is, is in the new parking field. And that's due to your, rules have changed since then. So we're going to have to kind of swivel it over um, to. And how wide is the, yeah. the turn in you get, what, is it 13 feet or? So that's you, from property line to back of sidewalk. Um, we just, I'm just saying if somebody's really using the sidewalk or riding their bike or something, it's, it could get pretty busy. So yeah, that uh, ingress, egress off of state street could get busy. Do we have any other questions or should we open it up? We're good. Okay, let's go ahead and, and open for public comment. You, you can you can go ahead and stay here and then just that'll be more convenient. Do we have any public comment? Hi, my name is Laurel Barney. I live on Ribbonwood Drive, so my property butts up against, it would be building one. Um, our, we like the idea of what's being um, shown. The thing that we are concerned about is the parking. Um, Orem, you do a great job at a lot of things, but parking is an issue in a lot of places, at the mall, at Trader Joe's, at city council meetings at um, parking for, you know, at the, at the soccer complex. Like there's just a lot of, of issues with parking and we are worried that it's going to affect 2000 North. It's going to affect our neighborhood in that, in that way. So 
Just as a reminder, we have an LDS temple that is going to be completed in Linden, and their access is going to be 2000 North, um, that light. Um, there are four um, exits and entrances on the Orem side in that half a block, you know, from State Street to Ribbonwood. And th there are six on the Linden side. So that's 10, 10 driveways or roadways that access that small area. That light, I, we just think that's going to be a problem and just want that to be considered um, as you as you, you know, go forward on this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else feel free to come up. Keith Walker and I live right behind this property on Ribbonwood on 16, 1969 North 600 West. I know you want to know that. Uh, I'm going to call a little bit. I've shared some stuff today, and I'm going to share a little bit that what they said isn't totally true, but I'm not necessarily trying to slam them. I just want to know it's not totally true. Uh, as we talked before, I'm going to read some of this and share it. Tonight, you're developing this property. Uh, we understand they want to make money and it's an issue. They want to develop and get all they can out of that property. But, and that's only good business. And the P2 cho th three change allows the developer to take advantage of some of these existing long-term zoning regulations that was talked about. They're requesting a variance of 22 stalls. We've talked about by the setback. They're requesting a variance on the 25 to 255, which is seven stalls. So they're requesting 29 additional stalls coming from the city to help them develop it. What they haven't told you is that they're 20 short stalls short already on that property according to their 255 zoning. And so really they're 49 stalls short in the total property and they're asking for 29 from the city and being short 20. They're trying to get the 20 that they're missing back to the needers and, and uh, Sweet Obrito's property. People's not going to develop in these buildings and go over and park in Sweet Obrito's property, even though there's 26 empty stalls or 20 all day long. Uh, so the lack of parking is a concern. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got off track here. They're, they're trying to use the extra 20 or 72 stalls from Sweet Obrito and, and Neaters. They admitted in their planning meeting and they admitted today that needers overflows. So they're gonna have a problem there no matter what they do. Uh, these existing business met their, pro they talked about that. Another concern is 2000 North, I'll share it with you. From State Street to Rivenwood, Laurel shared some of the exits and entrances. Uh, the developers drawing, a concern we have, and we've been told that's not gonna happen, but they have drawings of doors out of these buildings exiting 2000 North. So that's only encouraging people to park on 2000 North. We think that's a mistake. They tell us it's not going to happen, but we're not sure. We're concerned with 2000 North that Sister Laurel talked about uh, and the issues that are on 2000 North. We strongly, we feel strongly that developers are still trying to put too much proper, too much on this current property. Yes, we are also know the section of Orem is an eyesore. It's a great eyesore and needs improvement. We know the city wants to improve it, and the city as parents to State Street as people enter the city. We generally are not, as the neighbors will tell you, opposed to wanting this done, but we still feel they're trying to put too much on this piece of property. We don't think there's enough parking, and then after the completion of that building, it's too late to resolve the parking issue. So we just would like to address the parking and feel confident that we don't create a monster that we have to live with down the road. Thank you for the city council and your efforts and your interest in Orm City on behalf of the neighbors of Orm, North Orm. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to do to just address that parking analysis? Yeah, Ryan, Ryan went through all the numbers just a while ago, so I'd defer to him. Yeah, so I, I went back and pulled the original site plans that were approved for the Sweeto Burrito complex that also contains a two-story Neaters building. 
Um, the original site plan required 25 stalls for that. And on this map, they're showing 26 there right now. So that's consistent with the original site plan. The original site plan for the new needers or newer needers restaurant showed uh, 25 being required. And they have 19, 30 plus another 16 or so. So by code, they were only required to have 25. They do have more than that shown currently. Again, I, I'm not sure where Mr. Walker's numbers or how they're being calculated. I'm happy to sit down with him, but running the overall site, I'm only coming up with seven to eight stalls difference, depending on how you um, round that number. And that, that's counting the existing buildings on site. So I, I have a question too, something that Mr. Walker brought up. Um, the the driveways uh, for for driveways that we can't do anything about what Lyndon's doing. Um, and I I look at this and I'm only seeing three. If I'm so there's being, currently oh there's a fourth I, okay yeah okay. we're we're actually reducing one. Uh, there's currently four. We're reducing the widest one that is kind of right uh, adjacent to the new two story office building. Um, so we're taking four and reducing them to three. Okay. If, if you count the sweet old burrito one. So. And then, um, the building, uh, building three, um, I think you brought up a good point. Will there be doors? Will there be entrance into that building from 2000 North or it looks like the yeah. parking is all on the South side and on the, the West side. So we're, we're trying to meet balance, meeting the city's zoning requirements for wanting to have windows and access against the, the sidewalk and also, uh, you know, meet the needs of how we think the building's going to function. Uh, in, in reality, there, these buildings are not fully designed. So the doors that are shown there may or may not end up there. There, this is a, a, a very well developed conceptual design, but, um, there's still some room to continue to develop it. Uh, we anticipate that the primary entrances to those buildings will be from the interior parking fields. Um, but we'll do also be meeting um, or zoning requirements for the architecture of our buildings. If, if we, yeah. so Ryan, if we wanted to, I mean, just so they could design the building how they want, could we red curb that 2000 North to keep people off that? I don't think that would be a problem. I have the street view up right now. There's currently only a three or four foot shoulder. So parking's not allowed on the Orem side. However, there is parking allowed on the Linden side. And so someone could park on the Linden side and walk across the street if they wanted to. So we and, have to talk and, to them about that. And our boundary okay. is pretty much the center of that road what, as far um, as the city boundary. How wide is that road? If Does it, um, you know, two lanes of traffic, parking only on one side and then a small, you know what I'm saying? Is it sounds like it's. Yeah. So on it has two travel lanes, one center turn lane, the three to four foot shoulder in Orem, I'm approximating. On the Linden side, it has a bike lane and on street parking. So it's technically wider on the Linden side than the Orem side. Now where that dividing line is, I'm not sure exactly between the two cities. So the red curb would um, kind of just be emphasizing something that wasn't possible anyway. Well, we could, we could red curb the Orem side to reinforce that there's no parking there, but with the white stripe, showing the shoulder that technically is a to park on that white line would be a traffic violation. Okay. You would be sticking out into the lane, half of your car. And our, our, and our preference would obviously be to not have, you know, people parking oh. on that street. So, so you've got your design, you figure that out, but as far as that would be our, our preference. So, so Steve, could, could we do a development agreement that they can have doors on the um, east and west and north? Of that building. Hmm. So we would prefer to say something like uh, egress only doors would be allowed on the north side. So we could still maybe have an exiting door there, but not a, a building entrance door. That would I, so. Well, plus I want you. Yeah. And is there a fire code? I mean, yeah, the emergency yeah, exit. Emergency. On it's, that. it's possible that as we refine that floor plan, we could need to have an egress, like an exiting door on that side, but it if you could have some language that said uh, building entrances should only be, you know, not on 2000 North or something along that. Yeah, it would be nice to just, I mean, 
we want it designed as beautiful as possible. So we don't really want to be telling you where you can put your doors and that sort of thing. But if we can control it out on the roads, that would be better. And we may be able to talk to Lennon about that too. But our goal would be not to have people parking on that road. So to answer your question real quick, if you wanted to do something like that, you wouldn't need to do a development agreement. You could actually put it in the zone standards tonight. And you could add a provision saying, you know, whatever you wanted it to say. Just put it, make it part of the PD 53 ordinance. Just so they can't park on the street? No, not as the parking, but as the location of entrances. I, th I thought that was uh, what that was, that was my question. question but, um, well, I, I just don't want to force them to put yeah, the entrances and affect their design. I'd rather control the parking some other way. We're, I think we're totally open to that. I just want to have the option for an exit egress door on that side if I need to for uh, a tenant to have a way out um, of their space. So, yeah, because yeah, yeah. if you had a door, then that people would park at the closest thing. If if they had to park over here, I mean, they could exit out to go to lunch or go to Sweet Burrito. But I mean, maybe we do that. I don't know. So they'd be crossing a pretty busy street there to get to them. If they parked on the 2000? If they parked on the north side, plus you've got a bike lane. Um, yeah, I'm looking, I'm thinking of when you had in American Fork, there's a new office, doctor's office, and they do, they have most, they have like right up against the sidewalk and they have the emergency exit doors, but you enter from behind the building where the parking lot is. That's kind of what this kind of looks like. Were you envisioning? I mean, I guess we're trying to find out what so, was your. So we we treated the facade as a as a attractive. I won't call it the front of the building, but it is a is a public facing part of the building. It's an attractive facade. I think that benefits the project. It doesn't look like the back of house. Um, the entrances that that we plan on pedestrians enter the building would happen on the two short ends and the one the long end that faces the internal part of the project. I don't think we have any reservation to being told that uh, doors that open onto 2000 North had to be egress only doors. Um, so. so how would you put that in the P53? Cause you, you don't want to, you just want to limit to building three. Yeah. Um, because you know, it doesn't since, work on since we have a, since we have a concept plan that they're tied to, and this is that this concept plan is actually part of the PD 53 ordinance. You could specifically say for, Building three, you know, the uh, doors facing no. two thousand north or egress okay. only, if that or whatever you wanted and to that, say. And that would work with that, that allows the tenants the flexibility to egress out the back of the building if they need to, based on their occupancy, but um or establishes that we aren't using those as primary sure. building entrances. Ryan, my only concern from the discussion tonight is knowing that Mr. Walker got a quality math education at Orem High School, the same, the same Mr. Udi or someone there. Um, so the difference, Ryan, between your math and his math has some concern for me. I don't know how we rectify this, but if we if we say 255 parking stalls for this area, then the 22 short or whatever will be will be worked on in the math. Is that correct? Because if we said we were going to stick at 250, we're talking about 2,000 less square feet to the developer, and I know he doesn't want to do that to get the extra eight stalls. But if we're talking whatever number you got up to, that's a concern to me. So, well, I went to Orem High as well, so we're, oh, okay. we're dealing who, with the same problem. Oh, okay. Who's your math teacher? So. We should be resolved. Yeah. One, one of the. I, they just need to be yeah. counted on the map. The property around it is 20 short stalls short. In their notes at the bottom, they say how they make that up by using meters and suey burrito stalls of 72 to make up so they have enough. But, but again, Ryan's math was 25 to 26 stalls. They were almost there already with the existing building. So I'm a little, I'm, I'm following all the math. I think I'm reasonably good at math, but I'm, there's a conflict here. So I guess Ryan, was, I don't know. Yeah, that. was the square footage of every building included in yeah. that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think would maybe be. what Mr. Walker, Walker is alluding to is, if Neaters is using 70 stalls or 60 stalls, but they only are required to have 25. That's a problem. Then there's there's that overlap that the applicants talked about, how Neaters at noon will expand out into the office parking. And so there will be crossover in shared parking. Well, shared parking is okay, but over parking is a problem. That's the only concern. Correct. And I don't know if you're allowed a second shot, is he? Mr. Can I make just a comment on that? So Mayor, that's up to you. 
Yeah, Hold on, this it, you need a, to be recognized by the mayor before you can come up. Okay. To speak. Yeah, and just, that's his decision whether to allow you to come up. I and understand speak. that. Okay, so I'll I'll let you come up, but just kind of keep it concise. Well, back to the public input. So if you count the stalls on the property, they're twenty short. They're getting a variance of twenty two from the State Street deal, and they're getting seven that was discussed, seven or eight from the two point five to two point five five, and we understand that. So if you take the property as it sits, not getting those variances, they're 49 short. If you give them the variance that they're asking for, they're still 20 short. And that's just counting the property. And it says it right there on their map. They know it. The, the reason I bring it up is they knew it, and they knew it when there was the planning, and they know it now. And they're still, but they're absorbing neaters and the 72 stalls that occupy neaters and Sweet Obrito, there's 72 there. They're, because of those seven two absorbed into the whole plan, now they have enough to fit the planning deal. That's the, that's just how it is on the map. So Does that so, makes any so, sense so, or so help you, me? So are you saying you're saying there's seventy two between Neaters and Sweet El Burrito, right? Seventy two. Seventy two. So was there originally less required for those two? No, no. I mean, well, he said there was. I don't know originally. Because he said I, there was maybe less. that's where you're coming up with the difference. I don't but know. But there's 72 that Neaters has now and Sweet o Burrito has, and they're taking those and incorporating it, like they said, with the rest of that property and developing it all at one time. They're using those 72 stalls to get to their 2.55 so, that they're so required. I'm just trying to understand the discrepancy is that the original for those two entities was less, and so you're, now you're saying there's 72. I, I don't disagree with Mr. Walker on what he just said. He is correct. There are 72 mm -hmm. stalls shown, existing stalls shown on the map within the boundary of those existing buildings, but the original site plans only required uh, 45. So there is surplus parking there. And, and do we know how many are, of those 72 is they're currently using? I, I, we don't I, know. They, they could maybe. You probably did that. that. You probably have some traffic information. It, it depends on the time of day. Sure. Yeah. But do they ever use all 72? If they do, sure. that's a problem. Yeah. Well, so. Sat probably the biggest time that we overflow is on a Saturday morning so okay. when the office buildings would be empty. And when French toast is a deal. Yeah. Well, and I often see those to the north of Neaters, the 19, um, mm -hmm. not really used. In the, are you referring into, in between the Sweet Obrero and the. Yeah. Uh, those are used less, like yes. We, we do a lot parking. of employee parking there, et cetera. Okay. And, and uh, just as far as our submittal is concerned, we, we followed all the requirements of um, Orem City and how we wrote up our parking and how we um, did our analysis on our square footage. And there's no intent to hide anything um, in that. Uh, and I believe the city has reviewed it. So, But, the, but that that is the essence of the disagreement, I think. Is is, 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 the, is those two those two entities required less parking on the original development, right? And so now their excess is being yeah. into the we, development. Sorry, Mayor. Um, but as we look at the site as a whole and we consider the uses, we do calculate the use for each use in each building, and then we show the collective result of that in our parking uh, count. And so. Uh, they would reflect what the current requirement is uh, for Orem City in that analysis, yeah. in that table that we provided. Oh, and, and, I, I, and I get that for sure. And I, and I think, you know, the biggest argument that you have is that the two levels of office, professional use, yeah. are usually really underutilized. And they're especially underutilized after six, yeah. you know, after five or six and on the weekends. So there's, you know, that's where you get into trying to figure out what's what's possible what's not but i mean to me to me that all makes sense if, if this were all heavy retail or if it was you know um all fast food everything in there it wouldn't probably wouldn't work but it's not it's a mix of pretty high use which is neaters and sweet burrito and then low use on the professional office from my perspective mayor if i could add i just did a count of the site plan of the number of stalls shown on it using the numbers provided, you can kind of see in there that it shows a little number in each area. I came up with 399, which is actually shown in their table as the total stalls provided, which exceeds um, even what their code of 387 or 88 is stating. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 
technically they don't even need the parking adjustments. So I'm kind of curious, maybe the applicant could explain why. Is it just for flexibility in case you need to change things during site plan? Do you have a little leeway? I'd have to take a look at that and see. It is noted that way on the site plan. I think it had to do with the way that we were um, considering the new uses against the old, but. Okay. Yeah. Just, a th I, I'm not trying to argue this fact, but on their plan, it calls for their square footage. And it says right on the map that they've got, they need 347. If you count the parking stalls around this building on this development, not Neaters or not Sweeto Burrito, they only have 327. That's where they're 27 short or 20 short. And then they've asked for the, and, and if there's not a parking problem, like I said, we're, we're not opposed to this. We just don't want the problems down the road in a year or two from now once it gets there. If there's not a parking problem and it works, then it's a good thing. But if it is, it's gonna be a nightmare. And that's our concern. Okay. Thank you for letting Thank me you. interrupt you. Any other comments? Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public comment. Any other comments from the council? I still have a concern about parking, but I, I mean, it's a nice project, so, but I, I am concerned about parking, so. Yeah. I guess uh, my, my concern with parking is I, I hope <laughs> your, I appreciate your double lane drive-through because that when I'm there, that cuts off, that backup cuts off a bunch of parking stalls. Um, and I can appreciate the, the frontage, the ones on State Street. I feel like those that butt up against State Street will probably be used by Neaters people. Um, I'm, I don't know, does Sweeto Burrito ever fill up with their parking? I've never really seen very rarely issues there. So maybe if employees can switch over a little North and free up the North of Neaters for additional Neaters customers and do some training there, you know, education for the regulars that they can find parking over there. Um, the whole thing really is to avoid overflow into the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the project looks great. Uh, there's going to have to be some education and training for those of us who love needers <laughs> during lunch. I, I, I mean, we've, we've talked about all the different issues, but I really believe that the pro professional office is going to mitigate the, the parking issues. Um, and then I just... Like you say, when you look at what's there now and what's been there for years, that doesn't add any value to Warham or the neighborhood or anybody. And the idea of you know moving this um, out to 100 feet as opposed to the 10 feet it is right now, I, I just don't see any negatives on the project, but that's just me. Other than the doors need to be exited. Yeah, and, and, and that, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll go back to as far as whatever they do on that side of the building, I think we want that building to look really nice. So it's this nice building. And so I think we leave it up to them on the design side. And then we try and mitigate the parking if it is an issue with Red Curb, back to Linden, do whatever to keep people off that, that street. Because that would be a problem. Steve, can you instruct us if, if someone was ready to make a motion, what they needed to add to the end of it about the ingress or regress doors? Uh, so if you wanted to add that provision, I think that you would just make a motion to uh, approve, for example, the proposed PD 53 zone with the modification that, and, and I, probably the best way to do it, if the developer is okay with that, is just to add a note to the concept plan on building three saying that any doors facing 2000 North would be egress only. They could just put that note right on there and then... Obviously, when they develop their plans, that would be We're okay obvious to everyone. We, we, that works for you? That. that works for us. Okay. Somebody like to make a motion? I'm good. You're going to do it? That's a lot of words. I'll do it. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the PD Zone 53 as described with the modification that Building 3 has doors, uh, the north-facing doors are egress only. Is that capture it? Yeah, and, and just asking the, the developer to add a note to the concept uh, concept plan to reflect that. Yep. And yeah, add a note good. to reflect that. Second. Aye. 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 
I, and all this talk of neaters and sweet burritos made me hungry. So. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Hey, can we, sorry, Th this actually has two parts. You did the first part, which is created, creating the PD 53 zone, but then we also need to uh, rezone the property uh, that we've been talking about tonight to the PD 53 zone. Do you want me to just read it exactly as it's written? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's, yeah, right up there. Uh, Ryan's pointed out it's on the screen right there. You've oh. done the first part. Just read that whole thing. Okay, yeah, I just motion. go ahead and read the whole thing. Sure. I motion that we approve the recommendation to enact Article 221166 PD 53 and, and Appendix 00, or is that 00, of the Orem City Code and amend Article 22-5-3A and the zoning map of the city of Orem by rezoning the property located generally at 1960 North State Street from the C2 zone to the PD 53 zone, approximately 6.8 acres, with the modification that building three north facing doors only, or be egress, egress only. Perfect. I'll still second it. Aye. 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 The rezones pass. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 9.3, getting, getting close to the end. Amending section 2-7-5 of the Orm City Code, uh, choice of bid processes. Jake Summers will present that to us. Mayor, council members, I apologize. I have neither Neaters nor Sweeto Burrito tonight. <laughs> but will you let us have fun? That's the real question today. As fun as procurement can be. So um, tonight uh, we have a resolution before the council uh, recommending adopting or amending Orem City Code 2-7-5, which is uh, the city's uh, processes for purchasing and procurement. Uh, to give a little bit of context for the, the resolution, and I promise I will be quick, um, it is governed by Utah Code 63G 6A 101 and that chapter, which requires municipalities to adopt rules regulating the management and control of procurement of property um, and the purchasing of, of any material. Uh, further, Utah Code 10.6.122 is the municipality's code, and that requires all purchases and, or encumbrances may be made according to uh, rules established by city ordinance or resolution. Our city procurement code has been adopted in Article 2-7 of the city code. Uh, based on the MGT study, which was presented at the working session of the city council on January 23rd, uh, we are going to be following, uh, recommending uh, the increasing of thresholds and um, incorporating different changes to our procurement code for cost saving measures, as well as to um, respond to inflationary responses in the market. Um, so this uh, resolution does four things. First, in 275A, it increases the formal bid threshold from $25,000 to $50,000. The last time we made that adjustment, I believe, was in 2013. So over a decade ago was the last time we, had, we adjusted for inflation purposes. Uh, next is in 275B. It increases the cap for the written bid procedures from 25,000 to 50,000. So we're just taking that next step down and we're increasing it to match where we've increased the threshold for formal bids. Um, but also the third, yes. If, if there was a sensitive issue that was coming in under 50, but we wanted to formalize the bid, could we? Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna jump uh, to, to head to kind of what uh, 275B allows. It allows for all of the same uh, procurement procedures that we do for anything over 50,000. It just gives us the added option to do a documented price quote uh, procedure. So it just gives us one more tool for any purchases below 50,000, but it doesn't restrict us from doing anything more formal or more intensive. So can you clarify that? <clears throat> so let's say we, we go along and there's some issue and we, we've changed everything to 50,000. 
-hmm. but like Tom says, maybe there's something that's higher profile or whatever, and it's 45,000. Are you saying we could just do the typical RFP yes. process just the way it's always been? Absolutely. So or, or we could do the, the new one, which, so we would basically vote if it was an issue, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, okay. so um, to answer very directly to your question, Mayor, Yes, 275A allows for any purchases over over $50,000 to either be a formal competitive bid, a RFP or request for proposal, or a reverse auction. By increasing it to $50,000, that's, we're saying we will do that no matter what if it's over fifty. If it's an amount below $50,000, we can still choose one of those three mechanisms, and we could also choose a documented price quote system. Okay. Um, the third thing that this resolution does is it inc incorporates the documented price quote procedure and it lowers that threshold to 5,000. So we're basically taking what were four different uh, thresholds and we're turning them into three thresholds. And then the third, uh, sorry, the fourth uh, item this resolution uh, takes on is it increases the cap for procurement of services or goods that are below 5,000. So at that point, we don't need to go through the documented uh, price quote or any of the formal bidding, but that is still incentive, it, it still directs staff to find the best price possible. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, I've already addressed A and B. And as we've looked at this, we looked at comparative cities and counties to to compare and see were the MGT recommendations in line with what other cities are doing. And basically we're adopting a similar format of threshold as the Utah County government. Um, they have 50,000 and over is one threshold, between five and 50,000 is a second threshold and below 5,000. Um, as you can see other city, Eagle Mount for example, has a higher threshold at 75,000, but MGT's recommendations were to to go to that step of 50,000 um, and really uh, just cap us there. Uh, the other recommendation of MGT is that we review this on a regular basis and not necessarily wait a decade to do it again. So um, as we move forward, I think that we should be looking at this every, every several years rather than every 10. Um, with that, I, I open up to any other questions that you have. I know we talked about this at a work session a while back, um, but could you just remind us and help educate our public about why this benefits Orm City? Uh, the benefits, as outlined in the MGT study, is that one, it reduces the time it takes for the city to, to make specific purchases. Um, we all know the costs have gone up for about everything. So as we look at purchasing fleet vehicles, um, we would be restricted based on some of our fleet vehicles to do a formal bid pro process as opposed to being being able to have more flexibility in asking for documented prices and being more reactive or flexible in making those so one it allows the city to be more responsive in in acquiring property when it needs to secondly it reduces the cost of, of staff time to do certain purchases uh, MGT believes that by raising the amount to a $50,000 threshold, it would avoid costs of approximately $210,000. And so there would be a cost savings to the city by making this adoption. Where, where they come up with that 210, is that looking back over the previous year or two? Or? Yes, it's going back over looking at what our current policies do, what our purchases have been, and then basically deciding from that how much staff time, how much time had we spent in the bid process and how, how quicker we could have been reactively to maybe have uh, had more savings. So, so to answer the question directly, as far as what Jen just brought up, it saved us say $210,000, you know, had we done this before. Correct. So, yes. Um, th this is the world I live in, in the private sector, and, and it could be even additional savings because sometimes if you don't jump on a price situation and you, you're going through that formal process, by the time it comes back around, that price has gone up and you missed a window of an opportunity. Absolutely. So it could be even greater savings and, and much more efficient for this yes. department. 
Thank you. Any other questions? I think we all feel pretty good about it as we kind of went through it de in more depth in the work session. So if somebody would like to make a I'll motion. I'll make a motion. I move that we amend section two, uh, 275. 2 7 5 of the Orem City Code, choice of bid processes. Second. Aye. 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 The ordinance passes. Thank you, Jake. All right. Moving right along. Uh, Brenda, do you have any comments you'd like to bring up? Just real quick, um, our applications are closing soon for the Orem Fest Spirit of Orem Award. And so if you've got people that uh, uh, you think would be good candidates for that, uh, please get them to apply for that here really soon. And this is uh, residents or uh, uh, residents that uh, essentially are great examples of the Orem Fest theme, or, um, which is honor, hope, and healing this year. And how, how do people go about making that nomination? Pete? Yeah, so they can just go to ormfest.org slash spirit, and the whole application is there. It kind of gives some explanation about what we're looking for, and it's just a pretty simple process. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. And then just last item, um, our city birthday is coming up on May 4th, so... Uh, in a little less than a month. And we have plans uh, to do kind of a day of service on that day. And uh, we've got uh, uh, projects that we're planning to do at Nielsen's Grove. So again, this was one of your areas of focus to provide more service opportunities. So that one is coming along nicely. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Bren. All right, we're up to item number 12. Mayor, I move that we adjourn to a closed door session in room 107 to discuss pending or reasonably imminent litigation, the character or professional competence of an individual or the purchase or lease of real property. Right? Second. Aye. 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 Aye.